Ladies and gentlemen, once again, welcome. Welcome to the Kadifa Seminar 2023. And our seminar has the objective of discussing the new active pharmaceutical input uh, challenges and advances. We will be presenting the results since the 20, uh, uh, the new regulation was established and looking at the flows and the new complexities which are presented. And now I'd like to invite to the stage Patricia Tagliari, the secretary of this area in Avisa, with Mr. Nelly Aquino, general medications officer in Avisa. Alberto Prestes, the executive president of Abicui. Reginaldo Arcuri, the executive president of Pharma Brazil. And Miss Marina Moreira, specialist in regulatory topics at Abifina. We will start with Mr. Nelio Aquino. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Is it working? Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Nelio Aquino, I'm the general manager for medication. So I'd like to thank all of our participants and the organization, the technical team, Hernan Ronaldo, everyone who helped us out in the organization of this event. I think that this is a theme that is quite important, especially now that we have a new regulation in RDC that it's ongoing now. Hernan always says that the training is over. Now we're in the game, so we need to discuss implementation. And we have a series of challenges. We have a backlog, a quantity of Kadifas, which are quite high. We've been trying to adopt measures to overcome this this passive. Some are ongoing, some apparently with good results. I think that this will be a motive of discussion, for instance, in relation to regulatory trust. And all of this process brings us some challenges. We have issues that we need to evolve in, like impurity qualification, approvals that are faster, considering that we have a very reduced staff. So we have a lot of challenges ahead of us. And it's important to have this conversation with all of you. I think it's important for all of you to understand this process, the rules. And this will help make this process easier, a faster process, and with more clarity so that everyone understands how to submit to the agency and what the evaluation process will be like. It's an agreement with the technical staff. We should do this event annually or biannually. We shouldn't have this discussion very frequently from the point of view of stimulating local production. We don't have so many different tools, but we can bring legal security, more stability, more clarity as to how this process works and obviously work with other authorities so that we are able to have regulatory trust in what Brazil has been doing. Working in other markets, I think that this is a role. so that we can expand to other markets. And now I pass the word to Patricia. Thank you, Nelly. Good morning, everyone. It's always great to see this auditorium full to have such a relevant and important uh, discussion at such a special time. Talking about APIs here, really the increase in our national capacity in the resilience of Brazilian healthcare sector is very important. I'd like to thank all the colleagues who accepted the invitation to share their thoughts, their perspectives, their challenges. Anfisa um, understands that it is very opportune to have this discussion in terms of preparations for a public health emergency. The pandemic is very recent. We've thought 
I've learned a lot about how important it is to have a robust, strong health system to strengthen our capacities. And this perception, of course, it's not just Brazilian. It's a worldwide perception. It's a reflection that the pandemic brought us, and it's still very much ongoing. It's a huge challenge that needs to be faced. So we observe all of these international movements, all governments thinking of how to strengthen their capacities, how to make their health care systems more resilient, their pharmaceutical chains more robust. We don't want to repeat some of the errors and some of the, not just errors, but the, some of the situations in which we had the low capacity of national APIs brought us during the pandemic. So we, we understand that we do have relevant opportunities to be discussed. Of course, uh, regulatory aspects can't by themselves promote all of this movement in terms of making the country more attractive and stronger in terms of its production. But we understand that regulation does have an important role. It must know all the movements. It must be very much aligned and be a part of this national movement of creating the, ne the necessary conditions so that the supply chains for medications are also installed in the country being more strategic, acting towards uh, uh, development and innovation. And we observe then that these processes have been going on. And nationally, we know that these discussions have been advancing. We also look very carefully at all the international advancements. We look at the movements that the United States and the European Union have carried out and are carrying out to make their systems more resilient, even India. The process that we already have uh, with India, understanding that they're so strong in the production of APIs and so important for the whole world providing these APIs. And so we know that we need to strengthen our resilience. We observe this with a lot of attention, seeking inspiration for important actions, not only from Anvisa, but for the entire Brazilian government. And we need to take advantage of the situation to understand the perception of the sector itself. As we've seen in these movements, these expectations, is it possible to delineate future scenarios for the near term and long term so that in regulatory terms we're able to prepare ourselves and to propose alternative measures in regulation that can uh, follow along with these situations and increase our Brazilian capacity. So with this, I'd like to once again thank everyone for their presence. And I'm going to ask the Dr. Duty to take the floor so that he can make his opening speech, because we have a lot. Uh, uh, he's going to have to, to take a flight right after his speech. So he should go next. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Well, I'd like to thank you so much for the invitation and Visa's invitation for being here. I think participating in a table in which I have the two main entities that permanently and objectively deal with the theme of the production of pharmaceutical inputs and in, in ingredients in Brazil, uh, Facima and Abikif. And not only would I like to thank them, Visa, I would also would like to record the, um, our permanent thanks to the Invisa team. I'd like to mention Patricia and Nelio, but everyone else, because this is not a simple task to regulate any sector. In a sector such as this, medications, and plus everything else, the unbelievable universe that the NVSA needs to regulate, it is really a day-to-day -day exercise of competence in, in which NVSA has shown that they're not only competent, but they have a lot of capacity, immense capacity and patience to make it so that not only the regulation is something that creates objective results, but all, especially this that is based on dialogue. All of these sectors, not just medications, but all of the other sectors, uh, foodstuffs, agro-industry, all of them are very science-intensive and accelerated innovation. So having an agency that is able to permanently be in dialogue with all of the regulated sectors is something that is not only needed, but is a huge privilege for Brazil for us to have an agency such as this. Uh, Visa is a little bit over 20 years old. It's a very new agency and has gained great leaps in capacity, especially in their ability to follow along with these innovations. These discussions in, in uh, APIs, especially the Kajifas and Difas, uh, 
Uh, so just to wrap up what could be a long list of homages and compliments to Invisa, I think this issue of APIs during the pandemic was one of the demonstrations, I mean the vaccination was another one, of showing that they were extremely important and significant, showing how Invisa was able to give regulatory leaps without losing safety. So we all the time have requested that these lessons learned can be used. I know that there's a process, but so that they can be absorbed into the permanent regulation coming from Anvisa. And finally, I'd like to repeat something that I had already suggested. I think we should have this memory of the pandemic. There's a lot of things to tell, time uh, goes by, things start to be forgotten, the documents are all electronic, these things end up going missing. So this is our suggestion. I don't know what the projection will be like. Do we have uh, this thing? Let's see if this works. Oh, something wrong happened. This one, this button, how do I use this? Okay, so I'm gonna make a very brief presentation, very much in this line. Obviously, I'm not gonna make any analysis of the regulation instruments, but I have to go to a meeting in Sao Paulo in the National Industry Forum, and the person that's going to represent me very well, even better than me, is Dr. Emanuele. And she's going to talk about these regulatory issues that can be dealt with uh, with a lot more knowledge in science than I could. So I want to talk about industrial issues in the production of APIs in Brazil. Norberto is going to do a presentation in which he tells a little bit of the sad story that we all know of how Brazil used to have an API industry and we lost this API industry. So I'm going to try and talk a little bit about the point that we're in. The first thing that we in the Fama Brazil group have been doing is going in depth into the com Brazilian commercial balance. And one of the main discoveries or findings that we've had is the following. Where are the APIs that come from, that are imported from Brazil come from? Because in 2020, no one knew what API was, except the people who are here. Nowadays, everyone is uh, giving their own uh, ideas. Oh, they're saying, oh, 95% of what they import is from China and India. So the first thing that we saw is that that's not exactly the truth. We still import most of the APIs that we export or that we import from developed countries, which is where this industry was. And they are accelerating their process of deepening the production of APIs in their territories. Europe does this, matching things from different European Union and national actions. And the United States did the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a huge amount of money for a lot of different things. A lot of them focused on health and the development of medications and in the production of active pharmaceutical ingredients. So this shows when we see China, that's mostly vaccines that we have this huge amount. That's not the usual amount, but this shows that the country doesn't need to be stuck to this difficulty in producing. producing. We have the conditions not to, to have this, not going back to the past, but we can do something starting from where we are now. Why is it uh, feasible to say this? Because if we look at what happened with vaccinations, what happened with generic medicines, with antiretrovirals, and now the monoclonal antibodies, you can see that oftentimes, it wasn't one or two times, many times when you had public policies that were well designed, you were able to find responses from the national entrepreneurs. Of course, the large public laboratories such as Butantan, Fiocruz, have a very important role, but the engine is the private sector uh, of the nation. 
So the basic hypothesis, which I think that we can work on, is that. Is it possible to produce APIs in Brazil again? Yes, because we have a way to do this. The issue is what to do to make that happen. So this is a, the trajectory of the industry, but it's also a trajectory which can be read as the trajectory of Unvisa. So Nelly and Patricia have mentioned this already. You have these technological leaps, industrial leaps, which are only possible in the production of medications if and when you have a regulatory framework which not only encompasses that issue but also that gives legal security to that area, legal safety. So it's a truism to say this but for audiences which are not in the sector people don't know how long it takes for you to develop a medication even if it's a copy of a very simple medication. Why? Because of this. Something else people don't understand is that you have a whole step of production development of the industry, which is already in and of itself very complex, and all of this is regulated ad nauseum. So you need to have an agency that is able to do both things, regulate, regulate well, regulate innovation with legal safety and with the speed that is compatible with the needs of development. And I repeat, this is what was done in Brazil. So let's go into why I think it's feasible for us to once again develop the production of APIs in Brazil. I'm not going to try and read this all, but I'm just going to make a few suggestions in the end. But the big difference in relation to 30 years ago is that Brazil today has an industrial base of national industries. And these are not just the industries in the Pharma Brazil group. We tried to get all the different national industries of all the different states and with all of its different uh, st stockholders. This is all extremely essential because this is something that the country didn't have. We had the production of medication, but as everyone knows, in a regulation which was a lot more fluid and with the presence of basically reproducing very old portfolios now we have something and of course the vast amount of the national capital industry is still a generics industry of biosimilars and of copies and we've established that without which you can't do the rest which is the apex of the chain is has its decision-making centers installed in Brazil. And something else which is extremely important, and this uh, is, slide is a lot more important. This is, this is uh, data from Pintech. You can see who is investing money, their own money, into R&D, national industries. Because, of course, what's going on? International industries have the capacity for investment that's infinitely higher, but in their decision-making centers, which is normal. They're, I'm not criticizing them in relation to this, because we know that their development environments are in these big centers, as is the rest of scientific and technological development throughout the world. But this is the second factor that is decisive for Brazil. You have a very solid industrial base that is in expansion. And you have systematic decision of keeping on investing in R&D inside Brazil from Brazilian companies. So a good translation of this. In, these are retail data. This is not for public purchases. When you look at retail, uh, out of 20, 10 are national. This is extremely important. Why? Because once again, if there are other tables that show that those who have patent protections, which are usually international, uh, which are international companies, they have a lot more participation in public purchases, but you can do a virtuous substitution of the market movements. So what is going on? Once again, this is not a criticism. This is just a, a, a statement of facts. You have a change in the portfolios in which 
the companies that have their development centers outside the country are more interested in bringing to the country their more advanced medications under patent protection. This means that they ended up not uh, not actually investing in their old uh, unprofitable portfolios. This could have been occupied by by companies from other countries. You have companies that produce generics from India, for instance, from Israel, so on and so forth. And this was, these were occupied by national companies. So this is the third thing which is extremely important. The market was occupied by those uh, who are here. So when we look at the commercial balance, we see that this is the medications commercial balance. This is something that has a very clear vector. Of course, you have this leap during that pandemic, but it's a vector that shows the following, especially starting around 2008, 2010, when Conitec really starts to incorporate medications into the Brazilian health system. You have something that reflects our situation. You have a universal free health system for 210 million people in a population that is just coming out of the demographic boom or demographic bonus so you need to more and more have a country that needs availability of medications that treat an elderly population that were developed for an elderly and rich population which is not our case we have an elderly population and more and more but we have quite a distance as far as income per capita in the OECD countries so this is a structural problem that we have so when we look at the pharmachemical balance, it's the same thing. I certainly know Hubasto has more information in relation to this, but what we have in terms of exportation of pharmachemicals today is almost, it's intercompany. A lot of this is insulin. So we really need to occupy this space in, in a way. So just to wrap up the graphs a little bit, this shows, this is another important graph. This shows that the degree of penetration of importation in the Brazilian balance, this is old data from 2017, but it continues more or less the same. It shows us what we saw in the retail ranking, that the national production is balancing out, at least in volume, that which is uh, which comes from importation. So we have very interesting conditions for us to be able to discuss these issues. And now, heading towards the end of my presentation, the pharmaceutical industry, and of course this link in the chain, which is super decisive of the APIs, is a national strategy issue. And our companies, and I'm only talking about the Pharma Brazil group, are actually going towards the world, looking towards the world, be it with commercial agreements, which is the uh, graph on the right, but also ex investing in factories. And this gives uh, the lifeblood, which very few sectors in Brazilian manufacturing have today. No one depends on knowing how you're going to do business in other countries. I think we're very advanced. Bikif has systematic work in this area for a long time. Now Bifino also has been working with foreign companies for intersections in a very relevant manner. So what I in particular think that are issues that could lead to solutions. Well, first thing, first, uh, I think Bifina and Abikifi are the ones who can give this data with more safety. We have API production in Brazil. It's not that this is something completely out of this world. We have production of APIs. We have production in great volumes of synthetic medications. We have production of monoclonal antibodies. And if we go to something else that everyone identifies as something related to high technology, which are chips, we do not have production of chips. We have assemblage of, of chips, but we don't have any actual uh, chip factories, whereas in the pharmaceutical supply chains we have all of the links. So I think that the first effort is this one. You need, well, I pray every day for every, every saint and from Jesus Christ so that the Ministry of Health finally makes the list 
of what are the tools, as Nelly mentioned, of use for purchases, for regulation, state regulation more widely speaking, so that we are able to define this. We have every condition to do this, but how are we going to do this? Well, we need to do this. We need to have money from the government. That's not, that's not the issue. We need to have coordination from the government. This is why that these previous examples show this. We didn't have money to, to uh, uh, manufacture antiretrovirals or generics. We had well-designed public policies. So the fiscal impact is residual in relation to that. So that's the first aspect. I think we need to define policies. We need to define policies jointly with the private sector. It's not good enough for you to have you come from the high Olympus of the state and say, this is what it's going to be. No, you need to build this together to be able to actually make it happen. In second place, you need to take what we have, which is very precious, which are the companies which are already here, and then you can make a big effort so that these companies can have, one, conditions for f adequate conditions for financing. This is the same throughout the world. This is something that is of interest. Having the capacity to expand investment for these producers, manufacturers, which have not only been the initial step, but which have been surviving despite all these storms throughout the last decades. And finally, these financing methods need to be focused on the update of the industrial uh, assets for you to import very sophisticated machines in Brazil, it's like a war. You have tariffs, you don't know what you can or can't do. So you need to really embrace this set of issues through public policies, which will allow you, will allow your industrial park to undergo a technological leap. And we in the API areas always say, oh, the national industry needs a request from us, so on and so forth, of course. But this is also a combination because you can't do something for the private sector when you by distorting the market. That's the way it works. So is it possible to do? Yes, of course. You just not need to have policies that develop that little by little. So when you combine various mechanisms of purchasing power, just to give you an example, popular drugstores, if you calibrate the popular drugstores and you start creating mechanisms in which you make it feasible for large pharmaceutical industries in the nation to have supply agreements with the input industry, it's perfectly possible to do this. What I always hear when I ask this, can, can you do this or can't you do this? Yeah, we can do this. It's even better for us. There's actually various cases like this. You develop things together. The people are here, personnel are here. You don't depend on very large supply chains, but you must have an advancement in this area. Otherwise, that will be what's normal. You need to, you need to have the most economic conditions for your production. So I think that there's a big theme to be discussed in that area. The second thing that I'd like to mention is that I, at least, as far as what I've been reading and listening to, I think it is reasonable, is that, allow me to just uh, mention someone, we need, we can't just be focused on producing omeprazole. We need to go a little bit beyond that. Why? Because these molecules, which had been blockbusters, they're commodities nowadays. Uh, so there's too many people producing this kind of drug, but... In Brazil, we have cases of this, both of verticalized production and production from input companies of market niches in which you first find a few niches immediately. And in second place, you need to have an active search of this kind of thing. High complexity APIs, on oral oncology medications, you have a battery of APIs that are already here or are coming through in which you're combining not only market opportunities, technological leaps in the capacity of development of the APIs as well as new methods of production. You have machines nowadays in which you can have 
very quick production setups. Eventually, you can even produce simultaneously two or three different molecules. So there's a wide array of things that we can do. Not only that, and we do have experiences in the country in this way, of this is an area that I think we should really invest in, and I think it should be a policy from the Ministry of Health. There's a bunch of APIs that you can produce without depending on materials such as carbon, synthetic intermediary materials that you need to buy almost at the final price of the API, and which come from the Brazilian biodiversity. I always use the example of the carpine uh, pill, which th that's what it is. There's another one, which I always forget. What's the other one? No, it's, uh, yes, Eperine, Eperine, Eperine. Uh, there's a problem that where well, you sell Eperine to China and you buy Eperine from China for fiscal reasons and our traceability uh, 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 chain and our amount of our, our, our cattle herds are a lot bigger. So anyway, we have technological issue that we already have here and you need to focus on other things. Brazil, like the carping pill as far as I've understood, is a very powerful input. You have eye treatments based on that which are quite advanced, so on and so forth. And finally, this is also where we already have some production which are those medications in which the product is the process and the process is the product using a simplification things like monoclonal antibodies, gene therapy, CRISPR, Carter cell treatments, in which you have another discussion, which is it's not simply producing an isolated API. The idea is to articulate all of these different productions. So here we have the carpine pill. So just to wrap up, my presentation and thanking Anvisa once again. I think that Brazil has great chances. What do we need to actually do this? We need to have public policies. We need the industry and we're also waiting for Bill 2583 from Dr. Luizinho, which is in the Chamber of Deputies once again. He asked for an urgent vote yesterday so that we want them to, this is fine. This damn industry needs to be considered strategic. So I can say this in this environment. I don't, I don't think I need to really talk about this in this environment. Everyone knows this. But we need to increase access to health in the population. What are the two fundamental mechanisms, starting with the, uh, with the idea that you have a decision of private investment? You need to make a good use, better than what's already been doing. Uh, the popular pharmacies are a good example of this, but you need to improve the use capacities of the purchasing power of the state. Bruno Portela made a survey. There's 25 ways for you to uh, make contracts between the public power and the private sector to use purchasing power. And you need to have, finally, good regulation and incentives for innovation. We're always fighting so that one day we have in the Anvisa mission innovation. We already have the ordinance 1100 of the innovation policy, which was a huge advancement. But this is what will effectively allow the set of things to be uh, to work together. And I think that with that, we could have one more of those leaps, which would be the systematic and quality return looking at the future at the production of pharmaceutical ingredients in Brazil. Thank you, Mr. Reginaldo. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll have 10 minutes for questions. If you want to make any questions, please go to the stage.
How are you, Reginaldo? Congratulations for your presentation. Marcos Miranda, General Head of F Fiscalization, I have a suggestion for your presentation to clarify because some numbers, we think about that, some strategies, and uh, it's not the same uh, in reality uh, regarding certification. When you bring the import numbers of APIs, China, Germany, and so on, we can observe that the number is not the reality. So we come back to China and India in terms of volume. The amount of kilos of import APIs, because when you talk about the amount of money, Germany is bringing in the molecules, which are more expensive. And our actual volume uh, addressed to China. So it's important to us uh, to guide how to act in a regulatory way. And then at the same time, I'm very happy because increases the issue that you brought the access to the population. I'm happy and concerned because you have a high amount of volume come to China and India. But in the regulatory aspect, we are concerned about the quality, which is the proposal of CAGIFA, GIFA certification facing these challenges. So I think that you understand that. So it's important for us to see this amount uh, regarding kilos of import products. I thank you. We have both, and it's better to work together because we opt to do as according to the vol uh, value because he, uh, so you are right we are going to balance that next time because we ca came from the ICMIs according to the trade balance but we are going to analyze that it contributed very well for us to have a better analysis thank you any other question So this question is for all the associations, but if they have been discussing uh, the uh, passive, uh, how to discuss a, a prediction, we had the RDC uh, 750 regarding reliance, and then gave me the data, which are good, and we have 82 to three uh, uh, regarding the pre-qualification of companies Wor worldwide we have seen discussions regarding convergence and the exchange of information between agencies in your point of view what is necessary in the point of view of optimization not not considering the sanitary risk but what the K the agents could do to turn this process more faster uh, and we have to uh, concern about the quality pattern. I don't know if you evaluate the ordinance. Uh, we got a series, a series of measurements regarding pharmaceuticals, an evaluation based in dependency risk to evaluate maturity, and it was published a uh, norm uh, proposal that brings how to regulate that. And in, the point of view, in your point of view, what can you say in this optimization process? What could improve uh, weakness of this process? Uh, very good question, Dr. Nelio. I think that going, coming, going back to the base issue, Anvisa has been working on this sector, this issue to build the trust we have uh, to have a leverage for that, a trigger for that, but you have to so consolidate that. What I think it's part of the process, Anvis accelerated uh, the measurement, raised the bar. And so nowadays, so that takes two, a necessity, ICH took the companies to an obstacle race, which is 
quick and it uh, uh, takes a lot of effort. And what I think that accelerates this process, mainly when we start to balance this regulatory quality of the company, we are in the middle of the beginning of this process, uh, the H23 norm. And I think that there is a lag, there's something missing FDA, for example, systematized that, and we suggest several times Anvisa needs to have a process of building uh, together with the company of how to do it. Because you need to learn how to do it, not in the sense of the theory, but how accomplish the regulatory demands. And I think that's the base, so you can uh, be faster in both tips. Companies present better uh, things, more secure, and a visa had the cap capacity to analyze that quicker, where you shaped, uh, in some cases, what's not uh, in so, so important. You can have another kind of data. I have a point on that, not regarding just on visa, but ENPI that accelerate that. At the time, we wonder several things. And the reliance mechanisms and recognitions are very interesting. There is a trend. You're not going to escape from that, but you have to um, balance that for you not to uh, lost both things, the capacity, that the private sector has uh, to rely on the regulatory agents as a permanent tool of evolution. And the second thing, do not lose the regulatory sovereignty. Um, visa, Mexico and Colombia are not on that, are not thinking about that like a regional agency because, uh, and my point of view, uh, they are linked. You have to do both things because of that, because the innovation is an exercise. We are on this phase to transfer technology. Some things are starting to be developed, but you only uh, achieve that when you are capable to build in the medicine case is something that you do a joint work with the technological nucleus. Otherwise, you're not going to leave this peripheral thing. I'm not capable. Emmanuel, in our behalf, can discuss the regulatory details because I'm somehow ignorant on this kind of aspects. But I think that just to finish is so important. This thing of this kind of qualified dialogue that takes time and industry want you to speed up the registers and a big backlog, but this com possible combination, it's extremely important. We have to, we have been fighting for more uh, staff on a visa uh, and IT that give conditions of work and all of that is around this conjunction. The companies that needs to be to improved and uh, the capability of the agencies to use that to concentrate in what is essential and do that along with the companies. In my thought, it's the big challenge of this moment. I would like to compliment regarding the reliance. It uh, brings different challenges depending on what we are looking at. So it brings challenges to the international um, market and the national market too. So we have here uh, that the adoption of reliance to the national industry on the contrary, it brings difficulty on the competitiveness facing this possibility of reliances and sharing documents with other agencies because it's a other kind of other type of reality documentation. 
And so I agree with Dr. Akuri to, to increase the dialogue because there, are, there is different realities and mapping the difficulties of each sector. And then you can uh, balance that depending on, and you have to take an uh, individual look because of the different realities and the optimization issue. We are going to talk about that. That regarding IPAs, the take that out, Kadif, uh, regarding medicines, it's a point. What's important? Uh, when you have an opportunity to say uh, something that be, has been debating, we got the difficulty in the agents to accomplish this implementation. And in the other hand, we uh, have some companies that can uh, talk about that, the importance of this um, uh, the national sector, it's challenge because of the amount of companies, the regulation to base this production. So small details makes a difference of a company that's going to compete, as Dr. Akuri mentioned, it could have potential to compete ahead with big potencies. We can see uh, some of them that are on the top line on uh, exportation and uh, that improves when we have practices that are going with that. So just adding to your talk something what Mariana mentioned, I miss uh, that we not uh, see what we want for the country. We have uh, uh, a group of manufacturing industry, and there is a protection issue. Because sometimes we see that we are closing the country. No, it's a strategy thing, survival issue. Because if we open reliance and do not think how the, competi uh, the outside competition is huge, you just have to take a look at the numbers. The biggest company in Brazil is not even closer to the international one. So how we can measure this power regarding the other potencies? We are outside of the world map when we talk about uh, pharmaceutical innovation. Uh, Akuri mentioned that we have more potential to develop the industry here than sh ships. So we could do out stage here. So take a realized measure. We, we have, have got a pressure from outside. What's this measure? What's the consequence for the country? And that's going to affect anyone here in the audience. So the business is important. Everyone is uh, concerned about business, but the pandemic w uh, scared us from this, from that. If you didn't learn anything to ha have a, me a regulatory measurement, nothing's going to happen. So that's it. Half uh, has other things to talk about. Just to make a small consideration regarding the talks, Dr. Aturi mentioned that the maturity of the in industries during the building process of the norm, we took a look at the background to approval of medicines. And we can see that's an uh, increasing line to uh, 2015, 16, we had 40% of the submission approved. And now the average is 87%. So it's not the agency evolution, it's the evolution of the sector itself. So when the, it discuss optimization based on risks, criteria in 2015, you cannot discuss maturity of process of manufacturers and half of that was uh, not approved. So we are in another context. And seems to me in this scenario that we can evolve a little bit more in this reliance and the norm is local. At this moment, it's going to be a pilot and could be a landmark for us to have something quicker 
in the future. Uh, regarding reliance, it's important to separate what's uh, recognition and regulatory trust. When I talk about regulatory trust, we are not saying that we are going to accept what was approved abroad. We have the sovereignty. We, re -evaluate, we evaluate what's doing abroad and then we evaluate if it's according to our norms and then we make a decision. So our estimative is the economy of analysis. So when a national company is on the national line, we can have other 100 kadifas that could be used, but it makes quicker. So when I talk about reliance, we have both sides of the coin. If you want to speed up, the process, we have to discuss optimization mechanisms, and that's what we have been doing recently. We have two norms, guidelines, and we are closing uh, the Reliance CP. We have the 750, which is a pilot, which is a model for some countries. We discuss to apply Reliance, we have to have a pilot, and the results we are going to put on the report of CP108. We have positive results, we have improved to do, we have a big amount to be submitted, and obviously we're going to have to evaluate if they are going to be approved or not. We, had, we got one approval without any demands. That, uh, that means that the technician take took less time, so that's the optimization without taking out the sovereignty. It's not under discussion at this moment, and we have to think on the contrary. In, we got a meeting in Sao Paulo, we will have a meeting in Sao Paulo uh, with American Latina, Latin America uh, companies, so I see that as an opportunity field. We need to evolve on the discussions. We are going to have a meeting after we consolidate CP, and that's were my comments. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank your presence, and uh, Reginaldo Acuri, the president of Pharma Brazil. Now, uh, representing Pharma Brazil, Emanuele Gelt. Thank you for your presence. Ladies and gentlemen, going on, we open the round table scenario of IFAS in Brazil and in the world after Reginaldo Acuri. We are going to keep going. And after all the presentation, we are going in space to uh, questions that should be done uh, on the stage. I'll give the floor to Mr. Norberto Prestes. In fact, Marina, we are going to make a double presentation. Marina is going to share the presentation with me. We have a full audience. We don't have any new face. So the speech that I, I used to do, uh, the majority do not hear that. We always want to bring some new numbers. Thank you, Anvisa, for the invitation, Elio Renan, to have this to have this discussion, opportunity to open the house for this subject. EPI is very important. We are reviewing and presenting what happened in the last three years. And I think with this speech now is to show what's the importance of the theme. And I think that probably uh, in regulatory terms, we have a mission. I believe that we are close uh, in all the pleads regarding APIs and the parts of the group and everyone who is here is going to discuss and COIFA to discuss some themes as Mariana mentioned to 
to taking out Kadifa for medicines. That's an opportunity on the market for us, and that brings an impact, regulatory impact. So audience, please, professional of the regulatory area, we are going to have some discussions, but uh, the purpose of those discussions is to see if you reduce the impact as we are going to show in, in numbers. So everyone here somewhere has have a responsibility to reflect on that, and the majority here is connected to the regulatory subject and the regulatory in terms of the company. We know that uh, in the company, we uh, they want to have the results. What we seek is always to buy uh, raw matters at the final price with a good value. The market logistic is uh, considered fair because the who produces API thinks the same way. But I think the impact of this process in the uh, medicine manufacturer post pandemic, it's going to bring another reflection. So the idea is for you to abandon the regulatory issue and follow the flow and so you can understand what's the logic that we are discussing the presentation okay so akuri brought that very well you just saw what happened dur during the pandemic the api subject regarding the vaccine was in evidence and it was a public opportunity to bring this discussion to society and to the government, the entities. And in, on this process, we realized some movements that the other countries had regarding this theme and how we are slow regarding this subject. So I invite you to reflect uh, regarding our culture and leave us on this comfortable position even after what happened and I feel when I see myself I in this scenario it's like a hysteric guy talking about situation that's solved so everything uh, came back to the normality but I still watching this process we cannot uh, talk about that so uh, if you take a look in the north countries like China and India they went on a radical process during uh, the their history war misery several situations that put them in and they decide to have pri priorities Brazil in its history, we are were in a very comfortable situation. It's like a perfect country with without uh, adversities, uh, climate, not any concern, real concern about the future. We just think about the image immediately about the next day. And we didn't get any plans. In this pharmaceutical sector, we need to think in the long term, 10, to, uh, 20 years. So in this process, we go through several difficulties. And everyone here have the, we just react to the situation. We don't plan. We react to the pandemics. And we went through that. And the entrepreneurs just solved, uh, increasing the amount of stock. And then uh, we just adapt. The supply chain in the pharmaceutical was broke. On the tip, the ones that uh, purchase, I saw how desperate they are. It uh, worked, but next time we can do not you can't have this situation if India with that size and its industry realized they could not depend on China when an intermediary plan immediately after the pandemic 8 million produce 15 inter intermediary because they were priority since the moment that we uh, went through this process 
we have got several agencies to build a group of CTI to talk about how we are going to organize to this process. We stayed during a whole year debating, and we, what we wanted, Abidif, is to define the priorities. Because yesterday, talking to a representative from uh, the Ministry of Industry, there is no public policy without priorities. Otherwise, when we take a look at the scenario, it's something that is scary. It conducts to, got cra to go crazy. Nothing is priority. So public policy only exists uh, only when it defined priorities. We didn't define which are the IPAs. I expect in, uh, with the meeting uh, in December, we are going to classify APIs because it's on the primary health care from SUS. So we are going to define that. So we are going to study that because we don't have uh, much resources. When our Cody mentioned about that we don't need uh, money from the government, I think the contrary. The United States depends on the money from the government. Innovation comes from the university that define the priority that put the risk, the funding put billions to talk about the the sovereignty. So moves the ch uh, supply chain, the universities, the resource centers, and the company to reach a result. But on the tip, how we are going to develop the innovation is the government that put, put billions. Any development program in, in North America is like that. So it's important they stay to uh, leverage the system. In Brazil, SUS and the Ministry of Health, we need to uh, concern about. We are working on issues, uh, bringing this reflection to you. Mariana, if we're going to talk about Fr France example. It's part of the investment development friend, uh, plan for France. It's a government plan so that in 2030, there will be a different France of, compared to what we have today. So it is a very strong uh, investment of the government, billions uh, of euros for the development and research. They are developing specific plans dedicated to specific products that they have mapped through different round tables with different entities involved. What are the products which are vulnerable to France and they are considered strategic so that they can be produced locally. France has done this. And we bring this reflection to Brazil on what we have done re regarding this topic. In France, they have research and development, money invested for production. So all, not all medication will be, um, not only medication will be produced, but also inputs, uh, ingredients, different ingredients that are produced in the countries that we already know. They are, they are dependent on them as well. And they, they don't want to be dependent on that because it was a problem in the past. It's not only about uh, the high-end construction, but also problems that reaches different sectors, different categories. So we have this reflection that it's not only about outlining the problem, but as Norberto said, to bring a resolution. And the resolution in certain situations, in certain countries, it needs to be short medium and long-term decisions. We have spoken to the government. Whenever we have the opportunity, we bring this reflection on how to involve the actors to engage the stakeholders. And there are recommendations that we include as support so that we can sensitize um, the stakeholders. We know that some agencies can do some some parts of the work and we need to check the level to so engage the different connections, the different chains in the in this chain. So the work done in France is really beautiful. It is a 100 page document just defining what they will they will do. So I really I encourage you to have a look at it. It's very interesting. It is quite inspiring for us. It is a positive example for us. So we have the French example, we have also 
in the US and China and China and others. So I hope that soon we, we will also be talking about that in Brazil. Just to give an idea that the problem is not only in Brazil, the US import 70% of the, I, I, the APIs. And, and when it was mentioned here that there was a reaction from the US, a post pandemic, 135 uh, persons were immediately nationalized, the ones that had emergency assistance regarding COVID. And the country was in an alert state. They are having uh, a work that is close to Coffin Prison in Mexico. There will be resources allocated for that. There's a closeness, a geographical closeness uh, between them so that they can have a production near them and have more control. Then the US is under this process. So just to give you an idea, yesterday we had an important uh, meeting at CNI with the directors and when we started talking and he started just bringing all the barriers that limit us to have the minimum of uh, capability to think of regulations in terms of having a developed sector of ingredients in Brazil. In the 90s, as it was mentioned, 50% was consumed here. Uh, of course, the medication was a smaller scale at that time, but it was around 50%. And most part of these ingredients were exported. Harchi was here. There were other multinational companies. In this same period, China did the movement to attract companies, as it was mentioned. And important, it was important to Brazil to have a more a bigger um, uh, chain. And you could ask any money for China at that time, they would pay everything. Since a, little, a spoon in the, in the cafeteria to the high tech equipment that, that would be produced, they would say, I will offer everything to you, a free, uh, free or semi-slave um, workforce. But we have the, the, the raw material here. So, but it was worth it for him, for them, because they learned the whole technology. It's like a reverse engineering. They learn, you bring the companies and learn how to do. Yes, yes, reversed engineering. So Japan did that and China did that as well. And they understood it's the most strategic sector in the world. The whole population is getting older. We are having 8 billion people in the world. So to have control of this, we have control of the world. And then they did it very well. And then we fell in this, um, in this pit. We made this mistake. And here's the reflection for us. So when you see even the state is depending on that. So what is the difference between the US and Europe? They react. France reacted immediately. Uh, India also reacted. The US would say, turn on the engines uh, of that the factory and I have the oil company to do the refined chemicals for that. So you have immediately a process going on. They can react, and we do not. So back to the story, having 50% in the 90s, China did that at that time. And we didn't think on keeping these companies here, and then immediately all these companies left Brazil, immediately. And to cooperate with, uh, cooperate with this process, we have the color plan. They opened the country with uh, economic freedom and all that. They didn't think strategically. When you talk about uh, economic freedom, you need to think of what you need to protect because the population needs to survive if something wrong happens. They didn't think of that. So it is the weakest uh, piece in this chain. There's no added value. And we see it is an important part of this chain. Then I would like to open positive possibilities here. We had a meeting and I was surprised with that narrative that we, are, we have lost the game already. So how can we in our best to start? How can Brazil do that if China, if I, India, if it, I remember that I was in China once in Shanghai in two, uh, 2018. I was with some specialists and it was in a moment there was some kind of uh, closing uh, of uh, API 
um, manufacturers. And it was a market strategy. So they, did they really close the factories? Maybe we know about that, but I think it's not bad. I mean, they have over 4,000 companies producing for them internally. The figures we see here are the companies that produce to the world, which is a huge number, actually. And then, well, back to the point. If I compare with the outrageous num uh, numbers of China, all the resources, I will sit and be standstill. I will be just paralyzed in thinking that there's nothing to be done. They are dominating the market, close the door, and that's it. And I told them, let's check the numbers. So we have $20 billion ma market worldwide. And you say, oh, this market, it doesn't, it's, no, it's not worth it to enter this market. So it's, I'm talking about $200 billion of IP, uh, API. 60% yeah, of them, 60% uh, of uh, an expected growth uh, uh, up to 2028. It's not a little thing. And you can see what, what's happening in the world. Not only new illnesses and epidemics uh, that are caused by uh, modern uh, habits and Diet, wrong diet, climate change. So the tendency for this is to be increased. It's a bigger volume of access for, uh, from people via internet uh, for other uh, treatments. The people's behavior changed after the pandemic. I mean, uh, at least most of the people. People are more concerned about um, immunity, uh, different treatments. So this figure will, uh, is growing. So it is a positive point in this process. When you look at when you look at Latin America, seven percent of the global production is here. And then you say, well, you know, it's it's not worth it. Let's just import. How long do I have? Well, no, please, please. No, I'm just kidding. Don't don't skip the slide. Go back. So. 70% of the global consumption of uh, API is, is in Latin America. So the US has 40% uh, of the pro production. Uh, actually, they have the consumption of 40%. So we, we're, we're talking about 7% being produced, being, being consumed here in Latin America. Thinking that we have 1.5 uh, ph uh, pharmacochemical industry in Latin America. It's really nothing, people. Now look at the geographic locations. I cannot see it very well from here, but let me see what I can show show to you. It's the registration of APIs. Oh, I have it here. Yeah, this this picture shows that, uh, just for example, we're, we're buying from Europe. Uh, Europe is a strong market, and China as well. The registration of building of new API plant with the amount of registrations of API in the Europe, in the European um, market, and also including China. So these are the figures in terms of uh, increase in the production Europe went uh, had an increase of 3.6 in the period between 2000 and 2020 Asia increased in 13 times so how much Asia Asia organized to position themselves in this market and we are not even in the map let's see the next slide here we can see The amount of companies of uh, API companies in Europe. So we have a uh, large concentration in Denmark, uh, 54, 44 in France, 43, 43 in France, and then uh, in Spain, 44, and now Ireland with a pharmaceutical hub there. If you look at the Eastern Europe, there's a smaller amount, but they they are present. Well, in summary, we have 380 companies in Europe, 130-something in the United States, 
830 companies in China, 580 companies in India. And in Brazil, we have 10. In, in Argentina, 13. In Mexico, 6. So let, let us pray, right? When, if, if you look at these geographic distribution, it gives you despair. But at the same time, you, you, we should look at that as an opportunity. Let me show you this one now. When you talk about opportunities and development, it is interesting to look at the different blocks. If you look at Brazil only, uh, the market to, to reach here, to bring the company to Brazil, it is not interesting. But if you think that I can have possibilities for companies to be here because we have a very strong regulatory agency, what is registered here in terms of API, we need to hire more people. But what is registered here, it's going to be valid for other countries. So it, it could be interesting. Europe and the US are, all, are reaching us to see how they can invest in companies or to build companies in Brazil. Because, well, you can see, you can see how the, the, this uh, geopolitical movementation works. It's not, it's not a joke. We're not, we're not playing here. If you look at Russia and Ukraine, there's a, there in a, in a fervent situation. So when you think having an agency, a strong agency as the one we have here, so that could be a good idea. When you think of blocks in Latin America, these figures show different types of molecules, the wide space, how much we have to develop in, in Latin America in terms of API. In the universe of 2,742 molecules, only uh, 129 in Latin America. So we have this universe. And we are questioning this, this, this number. We think it's even smaller than 5%. We are evaluating the, the data to be to publish next year. But looking at these figures, we see we have a lot of opportunity in Latin America. And there was an, invi an invitation uh for the event in sao paulo in the beginning of december latin american event uh concerning apis and we're going to debate that debate the position of brazil in this block to think of this supply chain here now thinking of distribution figures we have the concentration in the state of sao paulo of companies that produce apis so 47 percent of them are in, in the state of sao paulo we're talking about the universe of 47 companies that today produce APIs in Brazil, they, have, they are registered at Anvisa, but uh, others do not have registration, and some of them produce only one type. So in practice, effectively, we have 10 companies that have a bigger portfolio that produce internally and, and have the capability to export. We have a negative balance of $2 billion, uh, approximately. When you think of the internal market, we do not produce one billion dollars of API. It's even it's much smaller. It's much a smaller number. So it's important. When Marco, uh, I'm sorry, Marco, I forgot your name for a while. So your observation is important. You you, you can you may wonder how can you make this big mistake in letting uh, China grow that much? Yeah, it's an it's an interesting opportunity, a quote unquote saying, but these are. Uh, ingredients originated from China. We have we have shown this already. In terms of export, this this uh, graph here on the right hand side, we have four hundred million dollars in uh, export. And just remember that in in these of these numbers, we're talking about uh, Noxaparina. We're talking about bovine fetal uh, sorum hormone a little bit of it and the insulin which but it is not the raw material but it kept fading out throughout the time and we are monitoring that so these are substances that in fact are not directly connected to pharmacochemical industry they have this element, but still, it's very little. This representativeness is very small of what we export. So this is what this is why we're talking about uh, disconnecting because uh, that will be interesting for the companies to invest in the production. So I, I think uh, 
my dear colleague can continue talking about the emerging uh, emerging technologies. We are getting far from this. Arthur made a good comment. I, I, had, I hadn't thought of that. We are a country that has struggles in the access of medication uh, to the population. We are not a developed country. And how can we do this adaptation? How can we do this adaptation with emerging technologies here in our country? So uh, in addition to investing in basic production of molecules, of generic uh, med from a generic, generic medication. How can we start this process to produce uh, more technological things that have a more better added value? There's a lot of opportunity. Let's not just be focused on paracetamol and all in very common uh, vitamin C. I'm, I'm just kidding, but we should not focus on only that. There's a niche that can be explored and to decrease this impact that the emerging technologies can have in the Brazilian population, considering that we have 30, 50, 100 million people that use the unified health system. These are some of the topics that we showed to the government in different forums. The national productive sector wants to be competitive, but it wants to be innovative, to be highlighting innovation. We have this capacity the industry is quite experienced, and as Norberto mentioned, it keeps uh, growing. There is a learning, a constant learning curve, but the, our, our market is prepared to to move forward in innovation. So these companies could bring competitiveness to these companies to compete uh, to compete with in India and China with commodities. It's not possible. But how can we bring competitiveness to the companies that from the 90s on? Uh, on they suffered a lot, so we don't want to repeat the, the errors of the past. This proposal is right there in, in the recommendations that we're going to talk about. We have talked about emerging technologies in blocks in the meetings that we had last year with Mercosur in the sectorial chamber that spoke specifically about the health area. We had uh, we were invited uh, through the Abefina and Fio Cruz uh, work plan and Abikif also was part, uh, part of this work plan, we spoke to Mercosur on how we could have discussions for pharmachemical industries as a bloc in Latin America could enter in, in the competition. And we saw extremely different uh, realities in terms of re regulation and, and production capacity. And we are thinking on how we can unite in our diversity to bring innovation according to each country's portfolio and capability to have growth not only to Brazil but in the regional level. Just to complete that, I'll make a very quick analysis in relation to CAPTOFAR, which is the association of the Argentinian API industry because they produce their portfolio and their, some of their portfolios and ours, as a whole, we produce 300-something molecules. In this intersection of both of them, 20 molecules only. So what is our suggestion? Either we work in regulation so that we can avail make available the, the, the APIs and look at how many uh, uh, possibilities of interaction we have both in the market and in R&D, which is of interest to both countries. Can it, let's go to recommendations, right? Yes, let's go to recommendations. I'm sorry the font is so little, but we have a variety of different recommendations that we've been talking about in a variety of different forums. So we brought a few of them here which might be important for us to discuss as a group since we're talking about APIs. And some of these are inside our work plan that we're gonna do it as a trio. Okay, so mapping of the intellectual, intellectual capacities related to the sector. This is a recommendation where they are uh, uh, working jointly and well, we need to work. What 
understand what is produced in Brazil and what is the intellectual capacity of Brazil in this sense. Where are our thinking minds in this area? And these thinking minds are specialists in what areas? This is important for us to act jointly with other government areas, for instance, the Ministry of Education and so many others, to try and understand how we can foster these professionals so that they can learn more. And we know that other governments in other countries do this. Uh, investment in science and technology, human resources. In our slide that you can't really see because the font is too little, we have an analysis in the diagram that says how we reach dependency and why does Brazil have this dependency. And then we have the consequences, the lack of production, and then in the bottom the author says, how we've reached this spot. One of them is because we did not bet on innovation. This is why we'll be hearing Abikifi and Abifi talking about radical innovation, startups, so on and so forth, because this is a way to make this more dense. We're going to talk to the Ministry of Science to say, where are our capacities? Because if you don't have a lot of resources, you put these resources where they create a, a lot of impact. That's not just distribute breadcrumbs, let's put it in where we need impact. So innovation is one of the points that brought us to this mega dependency. And the second point that we have for our reflection is the one that we'd spoiled before and that we always mention when we have the priority, which is the prioritization of analysis for <clears throat> petitions related to national IPAs and the production and the prioritization and the production of the IFAVs uh, to incentivate the use of Brazilian biodiversity. What are these? They are vegetable IPAs. It would be something like a VIPA. And we have a rich biodiversity. We need to mention this and we need to take advantage of this. We have a common associate that produces locally products that come from biodiversity, they uh, invest in innovation. It is a success case, and we have so many others that are also looking at this. Can I also take advantage in what you mentioned very quickly? I have, a, I have authorization to speak, so if someone is representing the company, you can say, in the case of Pilocarpine, those of you who don't know, last year, Abvi uh, has uh, launched a new eyedrop for Farsighted, I don't know how many drops you put in, but you you can put it, you can use it for six hours and then not use your glasses. And the carping comes from the Brazilian biodiversity. It's 98% of what is produced in Brazil is, is exported. And I can, can I keep on speaking? Yes, you can keep on speaking. Okay, so I'm not going to be, uh, not going to, to be arrested or receive a lawsuit. I know that you might have seen this in the media that we have clinical trials at the th th third clinical levels. The Epiflora and the research center are doing a vital legal treatment with substances from Brazilian biodiversity. And so what's important to mention is that the results are very positive thus far in this process. And 2% of the world population has vitiligo. That's 2%. This technology is being negotiated with a huge American multinational, but this could be the first national blockbuster medication. I hope that it is because this will inspire other industries and the perspective of profit. If that happens, just thinking about those 2% is of over $6 billion in the first year. So just to say that there's good things going on as well. Sure, sure, yes, there are. Another point is the development of public policies for technological development, innovation, and uh, API production. And this sentence represents a lot. It's like Dr. Arturi mentioned. It's very important to foster policies, yes, so that we can discuss innovation, but we also need to deal with the regulatory environment. But before that, there's a lot to happen because the business uh, community needs legal safety. They're not going to invest their resources into things that are born in difficulty or that are extremely challenging or that won't be made concrete. 
So there's an environment of public policies that's important to be fostered. And we've been doing this from the beginning of the pandemic in a variety of different fora. We are in a very uh, good moment to talk about IEPIs. We have investments from the government in this area, the PAC. Uh, I know this isn't a forum to talk about this, but the PAC program, the Accelerated Growth Program, uh, the other people are doing this, other countries are doing this, but we also have investments in Brazil. We have different paths, different steps being made in different speeds, but it has been happening. But it's important for us to point out here that whenever there is a bill in Abiqui, in Farmer Brazil, are, it's important for us to remember memory, for us to foster and stimulate the sector. And I'm going to talk about 4209 as well. A list of APIs with an alignment of strategic interest of the country and of the pharmacochemical sector for uh, to serve the single health system, to help the, the healthcare system. You saw this in France. They had a long journey with a variety of different entities so that we create a list of products and then consequently they are extending the theme to APIs as well, according to what I mentioned earlier, and we need to observe this very much. Another good news is that this list is provoking Latin American countries to also uh, making a list like this so that we can cross-reference these lists and we can identify the best ones so that we can get resources not only in each uh, country, but also for from the World Health Organization for instance, uh, or the American Health Organization, and so that this or that country is uh, investing in this technology, and maybe we can reach 10 key APIs, and then we can work with a lot more strength as a regional movement. In some moment, we'll also be talking about regulation when we're talking about these lists, this list. So it's important for us to always have that in mind. Regionalization of the production of pharmaceutical inputs with other countries in Latin America, that's what we've been talking about. And also keeping the agency and visa. Our goal is to have an visa as the reference for Latin America to avoid what Dr. Arturio mentioned. What Dr. Arcuri mentioned the uh, agreement that Colombia is doing, that's not good at all. And then talking about Bill 4209, whenever possible, we want to uh, approve proposals of important regulatory frameworks that unblock uh, sectorial difficulties and so many others. We talk about 4209 because it's a bill that talks about prioritizing APIs that are produced locally, the production of seminars and workshops that are more frequent to debate this theme. And of course, we already talked about this and we are in one. We talked about this, Patricia Nella. This is also in our working plan because I really miss this. I think that we need to have other discussions like this and with big groups, so many different NVs and stakeholders here involved in a discussion of a theme that everyone has been talking about. And it's a theme that bring certain difficulties for the whole supply chain, both the pharma chemical and the pharmaceutical sector. So it encompasses both sectors. So we, so it's important for us to have discussions such as these as much as possible. We're gonna have this last slide, but yes, we're gonna have a regulatory workshop for Latin America next year. We need to uh, update the census of the productive capacities of uh, APIs in the country for the consolidation of the missing productive links. So Phil Cruz made an important survey around 2007 and 2014, which was a survey they inspected every pharmacochemical industry and they made a census in which they talked about the sectorial difficulties and it was very interesting this became world renowned paper and this also helped in decision making both for the government in relation to some of these things certainly this document came here to Invisa because it was a very interesting piece of work and we've also brought this few clues expertise doing these two rounds of censuses to a third round. So we'll be doing this uh, in 2024, an update of the census. And then we will include APIs, vegetable APIs, animal APIs, the pandemic caused you a problem. You said 2014, 
We're going to be doing this update now. It's already ongoing. Pio Cruz already started uh, the, the 10 visits. And this week we'll have other visits. And the delivery, they're using the Invisa list as a, the basis, which are those 47 plants. And we're going to be expanding this a bit to think about biological uh, products. And this result should probably be delivered maybe March next year. And we'll have a workshop to, to talk about this to represent these to present these results. What's the importance of this? Productive capacity, investment in infrastructure. Where are we? Because we've been talking about this with the Ministry of Development, the Ministry of Health. What can we ask from you? And up to what point can you deliver on this? What do you have? And so we were able to map this out to know where we need investments, where we have more potential, so that our effort is is directed towards the right way. We'll have discussions with the other agencies about new perspectives for the production of APIs aligned to uh, best practices. And we also want to invite Envisa so that we are able to have a more in-depth discussion because we know that there's a variety of ways to produce. And we've been seeing ESG practices being very strong. So I believe that in a strong, having a strong, innovative, competitive pharmacochemical industry, they all will also necessarily be uh, connected to these sort of innovative practices, such as ESG. If you look at the reports of so many other API producing companies with their difficulties in the production, maybe we can have a national industry that has practices that are aligned with DSG. So it'll be great to, I'd just like to add to this because sometimes she says this and it's so beautiful and say ESG, wow, that's amazing. But, but the truth is things are very hard right now. So ESG issues, the world is, they want, the world wants this. So API industries, if you don't know, they pollute a lot and the world is melting. I think you've realized this. And from now on, we'll be, uh, asked for this in Dr. Meruzzi for the last two years or so. Patricia was in one of these meetings. One of the competitive factors that Brazil could think about as, and how the agency could enter into this in relation to Brazil and the world in relation to APIs is our energy mix. These are the ESG uh, issues. We already have a, an environmental legislation which is very rigorous, which is asked for in the in the endpoints. And so how can the energy mix impact this with, with uh, uh, in the price? And even China couldn't be interested in this. How can we present this to the outside world? We can create technological routes which are a lot more efficient here using a clean energy mix. So today it, it was in the parliamentary front, the chemical parliamentary front in the hydrogen event. Brazil is going to start exporting hydrogen we're gonna have an export hydrogen so we can have a very clean energy mix. And the United States is interested, everyone wants to do interest because they're not gonna to have to pay their carbon tariffs. So China could be interested. These are opportunities that we try and identify so that we're not blocked. The good thing to do these kinds of things with friends is that we have two different points of view, but the, the, the topics uh, is the same, the difficulties in producing APIs. And then finally, the proposals for technological challenges in Brazil, we may mention in this in some presentations at the beginning, Farmer Brazil also talked about this, challenges of monoclonal antibodies, and this is also a part of our work. So we need to think about how to produce antibiotics, monoclonal antibodies, but we also need to think about both in the future and the past, because that, as it was mentioned, it's a country that has its own characteristics different from others. We have a lot of dependency. We have challenges which we need to face, but it's not enough for a national industry to just look at innovation and not look at the environment that it lives in and that it's producing. And so antibiotics are a difficult, monoclonal antibodies are also difficult. Some commodities are also difficult. So these are the proposals that we're gonna be bringing in our work group. 
in our work plan. I think you could monitor it throughout the year. We'll have two years in our work plan, and I think that we'll have a lot of discussions with Avisa on this topic. I swear that I'm... I also like to say that Abifina is going to institutionally support this event that is being integrally produced by Abikifi. And so just before the last item that you mentioned, and I could reinforce this, I think it's important for us to also say this. Maybe the part of the group here sees the Abikif in a partnership with Apex in a movement to stimulate and to, to, to improve these uh, markets. This has to do with the last item that we mentioned. And I'd like to congratulate Invisa, and we want to encourage Invisa to keep on in this path of innovation. I think the workshop that we had here in October was great. They were going to have bids in the beginning of the year to try and evaluate new disruptive technologies. We're going to open a new bid for this, so we're opening this possibility for us to create inspiring cases to go forward. Well, the seminar is here. I'm sure that I'll see all of you there in Sao Paulo. We are inviting six agencies from throughout Latin America. We're bringing two, I think that's actually four specialists and debaters. No, that's just a specialist. Speakers, international speakers. Lawrence is one of them. He's going to be talking about regulatory science. Mati is also going to talk about this. They're together with uh, Lawrence in this process. We're also bringing you Alison Wortley, uh, this researcher. You can find all of this on their website. We're supposed to have the QR code here, but we, we ended up not putting in. The, they have a partnership with Indeg, and we're going to have very important top topics. So the things that Marina mentioned as far as the partnership, the projects that we're doing in the next two years, we'll have other announcements as well. Uh, for the sector that are important, including from FINEPI and from the ministry. So the first day is focused on innovation. We're going to have the delivery of the phytotherapeutic awards in the event. Uh, Bikifi is also turning 40. Actually, we turned 40 on, on, on October, but we're going to be commemorating at that point. And we're going to talk about regulation Latin America and then Brazil. We're also going to talk about industrialization in some sectors to try and inspire people. And it's going to be just an information beating. You're going to have a lot of news to hear in that event. Thank you very much. So guys, thank you very much. I thank you the presentation. Personally, I think that's a very opportunity, a good opportunity to hear if people are engaged, several actions going on. So have this opportunity with civil servants from Visa, hearing your vision with those projects, the difficulties, the desires and the expectations help us to see what uh, is the effort that's necessary to understand this process. We understand that we have important pathway to be development, to improve and efficiency. I'm going to make some comments. We can open to a uh, maximum of two questions. And Anvisa has been doing those things, have been seeking approach, regulatory approach that promote improvement. We management uh, look at our lines, our times, and that uh, disturb us. We don't want to have lines and to delay access to uh, access the population to products. We want to speed up those processes. So when we talk about reliance, we feel pressure. And the pressure is about efficiency. It's not to favor any kind of product. The agency had a position to uh, ensure the real prices of the market to speed up, deliver more, to be more efficient. So we adopted the uh, context of reliance to have more efficient practices and deliver more to the population. So reliance is on that sense and other initiatives that are being discussed so we can be more efficient. That what moves us. We have been thinking about several ways how we can be better, keeping the quality standards. 
I would like to make a comment. We are very exciting about the information that's going to be launched. All the governmental entities are on the agenda, so we can have the politics on the right place, so the process could be more dec decisive. At the end of the pandemic, several countries went forward and we want to do that in a more concrete way in the regulatory terms we are very anxious uh, regarding those information so we can align this information and be prepared for the important information so we can contribute so the country reach good results and become more resilient and the national sovereignty we would be more prepared for uh, emergence, health emergencies. Uh, regarding uh, regulatory science and innovation, we have seen uh, big efforts to promote innovation abroad, and we felt that maybe the country is not on the right moment to discuss that in the past. And Nowadays, we see that we are on this moment. Uh, people are prepared and, go, and innovation is going to contribute to the national development and we can attack the weakness of the health chain that we know. So the agency is aware of that uh, the, by its innovation policy and the agency need to develop some pathways and I want to say that somehow the, in the Brazilian law, everything needed to be written and the norms need to be followed. The, we have a challenge to find the flow, the regulatory flow that allows to incorporate some new processes, some certain innovations. That's a challenge and to focus its activity what's on the risk simplifying everything that it would be could be simplified so somehow when we discuss innovation that this agenda need to be in all levels of the agency so we uh, observe that and we are in some movement uh, discussing regulatory science. Why the agencies are so linked on this theme? A big part of this is to favor innovation. And the regulatory science are the studies, proofs, and criteria that are necessary to ensure the quality and efficiency of a medicine. And what's not necessary? So we understand the technology and what we need to have in the regulatory aspect, as aspect to put that on the market. Lawrence talks about that. It's what we need to think in terms of a visa. And the regulatory authorities has its own authoritarian nucleus that promotes changes in the regulatory landmarks. So what do I need in terms of regulations and what do I not need? So the agency has been tracking. It's a process that the agents still have to go forward and facing our daily challenges. When we have this big line, how we can dedicate to uh, regulatory approaches that are more innovative. We all need to face that in a joint way. The last comment is this challenge of the uh, incorporate ASG aspects. It's something that Brazilian government is going on this direction and yeah, identify the intersection point. What will the agents need to do to favor this agenda? We are starting the discussion, so all the contribution is going to be useful to increase the perspective of actuation so we can go forward. I'm going to uh, pass over to Elio if you don't have any questions, but I would like to uh, 
transmit the greeting of Professor Jerusa. He, she's sorry about not being here, congratulating all the team for the discussion. And we hope to have the opportunity to do this discussion in a more often way and go forward on that. So I'm going to end my talk. Just one little comment. It's very productive. So it's important to show a change of the scenario. Some years ago, if Anvisa discussed specific strategies to found funding the national industry, Anvisa is not a funding. Uh, we are regulatory and access and security entity. So we lived the pandemic so intensely that we saw the opportunity to add on to the national policies to favor the national sovereignty to have a resilience on that, thinking about a public health focus. So this reality anchored to the public policy that are being developed, the agency encounter that promote the pharmaceutical industry in Brazil. So in this moment, we hear the proposal to unlink GIFA from the register. Maybe in the past, Anvisa would say, we don't have condition to start that. We need products on the market. We're not thinking about science. But I cannot anticipate how you're going to react to this issue. But the issue is about advances and the uh, capacity of, of response. So we doubting. So how are you going to face that and give this response, consider our demands, our legal obligations, how we can deal with these activities? Thank you very much, Nelio. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Patricia's talk that I would reflect at the end. The regulatory science is very relevant. And the issue about prioritization uh, to the APIs, their uh, local manufacturing. That is captured uh, under the discussion what's priority or not. So our daily effort on the regulation, it's about the line and not improve the regulatory environment. We, all, we are always mentioned uh, about the lines. When we have long lines, we are going to spend efforts in improvement processes discussing issues of regulation, but we are not dealing with the necessary aspect which are more which are the more adequate. We have several bottlenecks. Uh, IT infrastructure, we have a great opportunity for improve to improve our processes. We can automatize a series of questions in a, that are manually manually nowadays. We are discussing uh, the plenty of requests. So it's a more organizational issue. So we can open space in this agenda to follow up the development from the beginning. And I think that prioritizing in today's context, it's necessary. And uh, we will have a list that the government will decide. So we cannot use the line as a, uh, something different. We have to have a faster evaluation ahead from the other ones. So the process needs to be equal to everyone. The last year, we worked on organized lines. So the result this year is better than last year. But we have a gap, which are the uh, assets accumulated. So to improve our discuss that's captured uh, on lines, 
it's a case by case discussing discuss so we need a measure that's effective so to hire new staff is not easy so we need to think a way of optimize so we have discussion emanuele people are participating sindus pharma to transform in a digital way improve the flows we have a team to evaluate up the updates of um, we have uh, teams to evaluate renewing of register we can add and eventually automatize some decisions AI, we have huge discussions, we have new borders, one of that are AI. A lot of process is going to be automatized and we're going to use AI in a, like in a pre-market to authorization issue, pharmacal surveillance. If you want to include an information using real world data and all the agents are discussing that but we have to participate on this uh, process and we need to migrate like it was on the paper digital and now it's to update this digital world so we need to be to be well organized we have the clones issue and we still receive requests there are double so we need to have a more simple way to use that internally so when we discuss lines and prioritization we lost the focus how we can resolve that so we can work in fact with regulatory science and we we have a good discussion but we need to solve the line issue so 99% of the meeting is to discuss about the lines issue. So we need to solve that. And now allowed us to extend a little bit, a little bit. So I'm going to pass over to So I just want to thank it's a very important moment that we have been living about uh, the discussion of inputs. So I'd like to thank the invitation to so we can could bring an extended overview on this issue. So uh, be available to have those kind of discussions. And we are engaged on this subject. Thank you. I'm going to talk a little bit before no bed. Otherwise, I'm going to not be good talking about uh, talking after him. And I really admire him. So it's complicated to close his talk. So it's good that he's not here. So I can use my words just to close up. Uh, my talk as a civil servant re, uh, regulated sector and as brazilian so it's the necessity of our country to take a look to the ones that uh, produce in the country so pharma defense the ones that produce and marina uh, got the france example so it's important that as a nation we can take a look to our country and as Dr. Arcuri mentioned, before the pandemic, he mentioned that I had several meetings with him in which we discussed the insert of the pharmaceutical industry as a strategic one. So we discussed that uh, in 2018, even before the pandemic. So it's important that this industry needs to be seen as a pharmaceutical that is in the country generate um, richness to the country and uh, making the country survive to somehow 
in the regulatory point of view, not talking about the lines, but we know that this is important. And it is inside all the actions that uh, Visa has been doing, the post registrations regarding APIs. It's a, an opportunity for us to talk about thinking that we are uh, self-sufficient, thinking about the necessity to bring that uh, from uh, abroad. So we need to speed up those processes. We are not autonomous, but we think about a way to speed up that. So we went forward. Uh, the RDC 1136 normative. We are going to talk about the uh, to optimize the process and speed up that. So that's important in the CTCS environment. We mentioned that inside the 415 that improved the change and the exchange thinking about the petition of the medicine. So that's my request for us to put that uh, as a work for 2024 and thank for the invitation. And we are uh, looking forward to more for more discussion like that. So well, closing, I don't know if you're going to have questions. I don't think so. Two things are important, just to point when you mentioned it was a trigger. Since I mentioned, I started to work in to 2014, I felt this issue about uh, national, multinational, national defense versus it's a battle. It, it exists. I just want to, uh, the point of view of Bekif, the national industry, it's not they that have national capital. The multinational has its registration here producing. Be otherwise, it's going to seem that I'm going to defend the companies from IPAs. They are my associates. I'm going to defend, that's my role. We have 58 nowadays. But let's take another look. The idea when we work with Apex Brazil is to attract uh, the companies to have a favorable environment to install. install. We've, we have some national companies. Uh, we got some that are investing on that. So this national, it's important to point that. And yesterday, we have a strong movement uh, because there's not new industrialization, nearshoring, or anything, how you want to call it, or national policy of health without the a, a very strong and structured agency. You are doing the impossible and working on the line. We are going to uh, talk very serious about uh, hiring staff. It's very hard. But let's go step by step. We're talking about innovation. If you're going to have the advisory office to hire consult external consultants by period, or you can have the civil servant. A visa needs to have an structure, an important one, to respond to that demand of new industrialization. So follow us on the social media at Abekifi, and that's it. Thank you. We'd like to thank your presence and the presentation of the, all the participant in behalf of the moderators. Thank you. So we closed the first path panel and the round table.
Senhoras e senhores, dando sequência. Ladies and gentlemen, to resume our our event, we're going to talk about the general vision and the um, continuation of the implementation. We're, we're going to listen to Mr. Hernan Góes, the coordinator of the registration of APIs of Anvisa. Good morning, dear folks. My name is Hannah. I'm the coordinator of Quinic. I'm going to try to be quick. Uh, we would have two moments of the presentation, but we don't have a, a lot of time, so I will try to present them both. I'd like to say that I don't want this moment to be a unilateral. I want to have your participation. We have um, a specific place for your questions. We are recording the event, so don't be shy. Okay, just if you want, if you don't want to be there in front of everyone to ask a question, you can send me a piece of paper and I, I can read your question. But as the the former coordinator, uh, Patessa would say, it is like a tennis playing. We're going to share this ball, and we really appreciate that dialogue. The success of this new uh, framework is from dialogue. It starts with the dialogue, so we want to keep this. Well, it may see a little basic. I'm going to bring, bring some concepts here. I just want to level up everyone. And after the conversation that we have in, on the round table, the round table conversation was more macro, and we developed it in different categories. We we need to um, narrow the scope a little bit. Aquif has a more limited scope. We have in our com competency the quality analysis of the what we call uh, DIFA, the active pharmaceutical ingredient dossier. We are we are also responsible for the issuing and the revi revision of CAD what we call CADIFA, the active pharmaceutical ingredient dossier adequacy letter. We're also responsible for canceling, suspensing, and revoking of the suspension of CADIFA. So everything that has to do with CADIFA is in charge of COIFA. This is the um, flow chart for you to understand. Why do we only work with these ingredients? We are within GQ uh, GG, uh, GGMed, and be below us we have uh, GQMed, so it's the registration of medications of uh, GGMed, so products that are considered uh, innovative, generic, and similar. All of them are, uh, use um, the APIs, and also we'll talk about the aspect of quality of this dossier. In the GGMed structure, we have GECF, they do the, anal the safety analysis, specifically the qualification of impurities. This dossier is important for us to have a limit, a threshold, and continue our analysis. We have Kuwins also. It's out of our directory. It is within the directory of GGFIS, the sector that is responsible for inspections. And the new framework involves the creation of CADIFA, DIFA, and also the classification of the APIs. So there are two necessary documents for re registration of a medication. And just to let you know that there are different areas working jointly so that at the end we can have the registration of a medication. So what is CADIFA? It is the Active Pharmaceutical Ingredient Dossier Adequacy Letter. It is a, an, a, an administrative instrument that confirms the adequacy of the dossier for active pharmaceutical ingredient. It is the main resolution of COIFA, and we work with it in our day-to-day -day work. ADIFA would be equivalent to CEP. Um, I mean, uh, yes, uh, CADIFA would be uh, equivalent to CEP, and DIFA would be the CPQ, so the model uh, 
uh, were, were were inspired inspired by them. And this is a, uh, this is a little bit of the um, scope, the synthetics, and the asynthetic uh, ingredients. And it's not applied to the a typical uh, uh, API and uh, modified API, the phytotherapic uh, or herbal product products and dynamized um, medication. We know some of them are included as a new similar generic medication. However, we will not issue the Cadifa for these elements that are primarily used in other categories. So we excluded these APIs, usually using other classes of medication. When they are in association of the synthetics, the medication has to be included as a generic similar medication. And who is the one who um, requests the CADIFA? It is the, the, the owner of DIFA, the company that has the knowledge of the manufacturing process of the API. So the company that is, that is responsible for the manufacturing of the API. It doesn't have to be the place of manufacturing. No, it can be the administrative headquarters, but it is the company responsible for the manufacturing of the API. They need to have the knowledge of the uh, productive uh, process. They need to have access to the documentation of the restricted area as we had this division. And there is another uh, another uh, division here. It is also the, uh, the one that owns the DIFA. I don't know if you all saw it, but Kadifa has a content, what we call content. This is the content of Kadifa. I have this slide from other presentations. It is in English. So we have the number of the process. We are more familiar with it. We have the number of the APIs, uh, DCB, and CAS, the name of the manufacturer. So we have the three S for one session as um, forward for um, and if uh, we're going to have a retest and also there's a, a box we call access classification where the owner of DIFA authorizes the use of CADIFA in a registration for medication and other information we cannot foresee everything so this is basically the content of CADIFA why is it important it is we were talking about innovation and I'd like to point out that this uh, chart was uh, this letter was an innovation. We had a model that had a very repetitive uh, analysis, uh, very um, it was not efficient. And now we have a centralized analysis in COIFA and the harmonized requirements. And I consider this uh, legal framework as an innovation for the agency. This is one point of this innovation. Our model uh, formerly was for re registering the APIs, but they didn't communicate with the registration norms of the medication. So it looked like two worlds that w would orbit, orbit in different galaxies, in different systems. This norm coupled very much with uh, these two words, the world of DIFA and the world of the medication registration. How did we do this connection? It By using the content of CADIFA. So any change in the dossier that will change this content we had to have the need to, to 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 protocol the registration of the medication. So the content of Kadifa de determines the changes that are analyzed only at COIFA, and what changes also have to be in GKMed as new medication. So any change that that, that concerns the content of Kadifa, we're going to review Kadifa, and it will have a new version. So we have the process and the version 001, for example. And then we review 002. Everyone that uses Kadifa has to have to, to make the protocol for it. The second version is, will immediately cancel the, the previous one. So 001 is not valid anymore. And then and now 002 is valid, so just uh, for instance. There are some registration information such as legal entity number, address, and other technical information such as the uh, specific technical information of the API, the packaging. So information that will determine 
the registration of the medication. So what is the what we call DIFA, the, the um, active uh, pharmaceutical ingredient dossier? We, talk, we refer to the quality of this uh, API and the administrative documents. So we have the administrative uh, documents called module one and the technical documents module three. The technical part, also module three, needs to um, be in accordance to the CAH um, uh, for, uh, forms. So these are the ones I'm not, I'm not going to read them one by one. And DIFA would be equivalent to these, their famous cousins, I would say, uh, ASMF from EMA, uh, DMF from FDA, I, API MF from WHO. So different agent, the agencies have the different names. So uh, just to summarize it, what were the goals of this CADIFA model? A centralized ana analysis, uh, harmonized internally, uh, and also externally with the internalization of the DIFAs. We have the only one uh, issuing of the these dossiers. We have the the registration of the medication. So we have now a unified norm for the re uh, registration. We have the seven. Uh, 73 and 200 norms. The international harmonization, as I mentioned to you, we now have the direct communication with the owners of the dossiers. That improves the um, the speed and the analysis, so we don't have the registration uh, request. And also, we promoted the um, registration of norms and the registration of the post register of medication. Today, CADIFA is part is expressively part of the norms of registration of medication. So here, it is the workflow of this um, issuing. So the one who owns the DIFA, they they get in touch with the request, the one in requesting for the medication. You have the development of the product, and afterwards they will send the open part for analysis and then we issue the CADIFA. It will be analyzed by the owner of the medication and they will send it to a visa. So we need to update this uh, picture here. The CADIFA, the same CADIFA will be used in different medication registrations or post registrations. So this was the big uh, leap that we had to um, debureaucratize and improve the analysis flow. And we have a change just to review that. We have the, the owner of the uh, DIFA. It sends the, the GADIFA to uh, Visa, and we check if there was any change. If if yes, we have a new registration. If not, it's finished. We don't need, we don't have any other regulatory need. It means that any change that um, has in GADIFA, there, it, will, it will not be informed? No. All changes, even the non regulatory ones, have to be informed by the owner of the registration uh, of the medication to analyze the impact that is um, seen in the quality agreement of the companies. All right, I will talk about this topic now. We will talk, we, I will bring some figures of the past three years that we have, uh, although we had a small volume of this registration because it, it was optional. So we didn't talk about um, temporality anymore. But since August 20, 2023, the submissions from this date on, the models are mandatory for the GIFs and medication uh, registration. So the requesting of CADIF should be, could, uh, was done in two ways, associated ways. So it can be connected to the registration or the positive registration of medication. And the CADIFA uh, team would give their manifestation and also 
the Khalifa would give their interest association or after a decal public invite. Given the limitation of workers that we have here at Anvisa, our priority is to evaluate the associated Khalifas that would be more quickly used in the registration of medication and made available to the population. If there is any a public invitation by the call, then necessarily there, there will be uh, the need for associated Kadifa. And uh, one more analysis. But until now, we didn't have this case. But it is um, a device that is in our norm that foresees the uh, requesting of the associated Kadifa. The norm says also that the non associated Kadifas analyzed by the in public invite of the call need to have the data published in the portal. And these are the information that, the pieces of information that we have, the owner of Kadifa, the number of Kadifa, and the situation, if it's approved, if it's under analysis or not. Since we did not uh, have the chance to evaluate any associated Kadifa, we still don't have the, this information for public consultation. It is a question that we receive uh, frequently and of when we're going to make available a consolidated text for the Kadifas. We don't have this uh, information yet. I hope that in the future we will do this, but it deserves a discussion with the regulating sector because they own the information. Most companies want to know the Khalifas that the other companies are using, but they don't want to make available their own. So it is a bit complicated for uh, for us to see what moment we're going to start the discussion. And we are awaiting a bigger number of Khalifas to make it effective. So a question from the association. Since the temporality period was finished, as we mentioned, that's has a has an, uh, an idea when it will be uh, the evaluation of the requests for the associated Khalifa? No, not yet. And do you have any any idea of the the possibility of the evaluation of the Khalifa with uh, one IF or two? No, we have a small uh, group of professionals to analyze the registration of medication, so we don't have any any. Um, date for the associated Kadifas, and we don't have any date for an increase of registers that uh, have to do with the analysis of Kadifas. So we only have resolutions 1A and 1F. So I'm going to show you, we don't talk, we don't talk about the queue of Kadifa because we don't use this order. Let me explain how we construct our quote unquote Q. We actually call them lists. So it it is done throughout the time and they are analyzed according to the information of GQ Med as they distribute the registers. So we have the history of these uh, submissions. There was a, there was a growth of uh, submissions and here there, there was a decrease in the change of the strategy that we had we could see that we have a, a big amount of accumulated um, requests, but it was not about the possibility of analysis. And we thought the, the companies are sending it without having a partner yet. How can we assess this? So we changed the st status of the entry of this Kadifa. So they start with the analysis of the external uh, sober testing. It means Anvisa cannot analyze this petition because it does not need, it needs an external action of Anvisa. In that case, registration and post registration of medication. The petition are in the situation, and when we identify the registration of post registration of med medication, it is changed to distributed to the, the, the responsible one. So that's why we had this um, decrease in the accumulation because it, it could be a future accumulation and actually it is so we had this adequation in our management of analysis and 
the curve is, is rising. And it seems there was a small, slight uh, change in, the, in, the, in this declining, and it made me feel more calm. It, it seems the companies anticipated the the this issue of the monetary adifa, so we can see uh, instability, but we still have an, an accumulation of kadifas. Here we have the list of the manifestation of interest, which is the code of uh, topic 1602. We haven't actually analyzed any of them, and we don't have a forecast to analyze them. We're actually uh, focusing on associated kadifas, and we have unassociated kadifas that are almost zero, because they come in, but we end them, because we haven't approved any manifestations of interest, and we didn't have a public uh, invitation from the call. So these petitions weren't supposed to be happening to be taking place. So how do we know that we need to analyze a Kadifa? So we have this Kadifa request, then we had a drop here because we changed in strategy. And here we have in orange the graph of the notifications because it is the notifications of the Kadifa process that are carried out in the registry and post-registry of the medication. They say we need to analyze this Kadifa for this registry or post-registry process. So here we can see that they're walking together. Before we had a huge uh, gap between them. So the, our passive was, was big, but it wasn't all that. It was maybe two thirds IFA. And now we can see that we have more notifications than Kadifa requests. Why? Because one Kadifa can be used in a variety of different documentation, registry or post-registry. So this is the this was the big uh, advantage of this model. We have simplification of analysis. We don't reanalyze the same thing about a lot of different things. So we can use this passive both through Kadifa requests and to request. Uh, if we're talking about Kadifa notifications, the, these are topic codes 11721, 11722, 11721 is for registry of medications and 11722 for notifications and post-registry because we know that the uh, timelines are different. Uh, registration Kadifa is going to follow the registry uh, timeline, whereas the post-registry is half the time. So we have one notification for each Kadifa request. If your register uses three different Kadifas, then I'm going to create three different notifications because the management of the analysis is through Kadifa. Maybe your Kadifa is already analyzed in another process that had, was in a previous uh, timetable. So we also use notifications to internally manage the analysis of the Kadifa in that process. So we're talking about the life cycle. It follows the Kadifa life cycle. And here we have a survey. 44% are awaiting analysis. So this is our passive today, right now, of 27% are in analysis, 20% were concluded, and 5% and 9% uh, finished. So you can see that we have almost half of notifications with Kadifas to, uh, that we haven't started analysis in. And what about the finished ones? Here we have some motives for uh this notification indicated manifestation of interest, so the notification is there to indicate an associated Kadifa. And sometimes we have a notification that ha it doesn't even have a Kadifa number. We have Ifa, so we can't identify it. These are the closed ones. These sometimes these are of a post registry from the pandemic, which said that the company needed to present manifestation of the IFA manufacturer in case it was necessary. So we might not necessarily need a Kadifa in this post registry because it might be a letter of interest of uh, having a Kadifa. So we also closed these. Some of these were connected to clone processes, and we understand that clones don't need them because they should follow the matrix. So we use the Kadifa with the matrix timetables, and some we had GQ Med uh, denied requests, or maybe sometimes the companies uh, 
decided to not follow through. And sometimes we have some more than one notification for the same Kadifa in the same process. So to rationalize, let's say we closed three and we just left one if we had four different ones. Now let's talk about associated Kadifas. What is the situation? 40% have analysis on external. This is a passive that is not a uh, passive. We have 381 Kadifa requests which were not linked to the register of the medication. So this is why we uh, adopted this strategy where we have a situation where you can actually see this. So that we're a little bit calmer in uh, the real size of our passive. And now we can really talk about the passive, which is what is a waiting analysis, which is large. It's 322 petitions, around 34% of the volume that we have of uh, requests. And the rest is under analysis, 10% of the total, 94 of them, 94 being analyzed. We already had 89 that were accepted. 15 non-accepted and 51 closed. Closed are the ones that... In the beginning we had manual submissions and then later we went to electronic. Everything in Visa went. So the manual needs to follow the 24 guide manual. Some of them uh, didn't follow the compulsory guide. Some of them don't have a, the administrative module one documents, which are compulsory. What's module one? That's FP and the declaration. So if they didn't have that, there was an absence of compulsory documentation. There's an absence of the restricted part. Some companies were only showing the opening part of the documentation, even though the documentation is being sent to Invisa. So the norm is very clear about what needs to be sent in relation to the information. And if we don't have the restricted part, then we understand that some of the information is missing. So we've also had a summary uh, den denials in this case. And there were some submissions that we understood that were tests from the companies. They sent uh, light bills, they sent tax and they said oh we have so much to do and we need to evaluate this if they paid their light bills or something i don't know so i was gonna i was gonna take advantage of what i was saying to say something else but i forgot no i just remembered there's the new regulation for company qualifications so i, I don't think it's great to send test petition and, and we're gonna we're gonna deny it and then if you're a company and if you're doing tests because there are no tariffs and you're creating unnecessary work for us oh uh, i think you shouldn't do that because then you have a denial in your back for your registration it's going to be in your history for all time Another additional issues the document sometimes aren't uh, organized. We worked a lot on the checklist and separated by actions. I know it's I know it's hard to divide PDFs, but sometimes they didn't respect the sessions and they sent it too much of a mess. And this makes our analysis a lot harder. So this is something that we observed in some submissions that we I think it's important. Try and follow the checklist, please. And this is in the checklist item. The documentation needs to come in organized at the least, and this makes our lives a lot easier here. Now, let's talk about the numbers in relation to Kadif holders. Where do they come from? First, I'm going to talk about the people who already have Kadifas. It's good because I have to read. I can't see it from here. So 56% of holders are from India. 19% from Brazil, and we know that a lot of uh, companies from the outside are here, so we consider them as being Brazilian holders, but we know that the companies are from the outside, and we can not say, no, this one is Indian, this one's Chinese, so I brought the real data, so to speak, and the idea is that it should be 100% in Brazil, that all of the companies had 
had representatives here in Brazil for the submission. 15% from China, 6%. And here we got all the different countries from Europe so that we can have a, a, a more robust data. 2% from Mexico, 1% from the U.S., and 1% from Turkey. So we have 88 Kadifas. And this is the scenario we have today as far as issued Kadifas. Where are the holders from? So we did this for all the different requests. Of course, we took out externals, we took out closed uh, requests and requests that were given up. So we have 56 different holders of 88 Kadifas. And for the global scenario, we still have India with the same percentage. So what do I see here? The India emitted Kadifas, and this is the scenario of what the future is like. These are dossiers that we will evaluate to be able to issue a Kadifa. So the representativeness is very much the same as far as Indian holders, Brazilians, the same. Now 18%, basically the same. China with 14, Europe with 9, and others with 4%. So basically, the issued Kadifas already represent, they already have a certain representativeness as to what the next two years or so will be like in, as far as solving this facet that we have. I also have information for place of manufacture. This might be more concrete as to where the company comes from. So in the Kadifas, 56%, 50% of the locations are in India, 21% are in Europe, 17% in China, 3% in Brazil, and 3% in other countries. So here we can see that Brazil is quite a bit reduced, and China is growing, and Europe grows as well. So it's 100 different places of manufacture. We know that it's very common that in a dossier we might have more than one location. We can have alternative locations or that continue, places of the continue processes. In dossiers, we see that there's an increase in the participation of Indian locations at 64%. China also comes in and second with 17%. Europe in third, 11%. Brazil keeps its rate of 3% and others in 5%. So we can see, I think it's interesting to see the two scenarios, Kadifas and Nifas. Kadifas are already issued. They're already using medications and uh, Difas are the ones we'll analyze and it's a little bit of our future. And the we can also see the difference in the holder and the location. So you can see that this might, this location might be more realistic to understand Brazilian industry. And so this is just basically, we should look, the scenario is, is pretty much the same. We see that Indian companies are basically represent over half of the Kadifas and Difas that are uh, that are uh, submitted, including the holders, and also location of manufacture. That's something that's very much uh, well established. They are the majority for Kadifas, Difas, and the locations of Kadifas and Difas. So it's important to say that this is a very limited scope we only have 88 Kadifas. I don't know how many valid medications I have. Uh, more than 2,000, right? 5,000. We're talking about 88 Kadifas. So it's a very limited scope still, but I already see a representativeness here for a larger scope. So maybe this is a scenario that will keep itself uh, true for the future in the contracts for with our tourist data, where it was China and Germany in terms of value. And we always thought that it was China and India, which for Kadifa is basically India. Half or more of the submissions come from India. And now let's talk about APIs. We have 284 different APIs in the 561 uh Difas. So I tried to do a, a word cloud here to try and be a little bit modern. It wasn't easy, I gotta admit. So we can see that River Roxabane chlor forming chlorhydrate, violet pimentina, sodium, dehydrated uh, azotromacine. So here we have all the APIs that are highlighted. I don't know if this corresponds to what you have as far as products that need to be analyzed in our queue. And now, 
What about the IPAs in issued Kadifas? We have 88 Kadifas for 75 APIs. So are the APIs that are the most Kadifas? So we have metformin chlorhydrate. We also have vildagliptine, acyclovir, doxorubicin chlorhydrate. So we have a few different... Uh, there, there are a lot of them in the queue that I still haven't showed up here, and they're not in the issued Kadifas. How's my time? Oh, okay, I've already went over my time, but I'm wrapping up. And so I try to do a search of how are we as far as medicine registration, because I issued 88 Kadifas, but do I already have 88 Kadifas in uh, approved medicine registrations? Out of those 88, only 51 are already a part of approved medicine registration or in post registry so for the other kadifas they're still in analysis the medication still hasn't been approved so that kadifa is still not available in as a medication it's a part of 34 ipas and 84 medication registration we're very much connected to this number because we're talking a lot about simplification so i want this number to go up to 10 because then that means that 10 APIs are used uh, in a, one API used in a bunch of different uh, registrations, but I saw that was one API in eight different processes, and there's three different ones in seven different processes, so there's some Kadifas that are being well utilized now. Here we have the APIs in different Kadifas in approved medications. So Sugamadex is up here again. Drospirinone. So you change the scenario as we change the analysis we carry out as we restrict the scope in different manners. So I'm going to go quickly through the f main demand items. This will be worked in detail with Naive in the afternoon in the most technical part here. I just have these boring graphs, but this is basically, it's almost like a heat map that you can't really see, right? So let me... It's hard for me to see even. I tried to consolidate this all in a single slide, and I'm sorry, uh, it was the best way I could think about. So here we can see that a good amount of this part, this sort of beige-ish, orange-ish, yellowish color, is the source of fabrication. So I would say that 25% of our demands are in this manufacturing session. And here we have some a few highlights demands related to the detailed description of the product, solvents and materials description. So these are the two big topics in the manufacturer part of things. After that, we have impurities, and this has to do with my expectations, so it's great that I confirmed them. In the impurities section, and I would say around 20% more of our demands are in this section, I'd like to highlight mutagenics and this is what we've seen there's a lot of demands from mutagenic impurities which is a new topic after that we have 32s23 which is for the raw materials and demands related to the starting material and then they don't talk about redefinition and talk about the justification of the the of the request they're defining but they're not justifying so we don't want just a definition we want a more elaborate uh justification after that we have stability and we're talking about protocol. We need updated stability data, basically. And then the other session is not as strong. This is almost sort of a visual heat map. Here we have the main sessions for demands. Manufacture, impurities, and raw materials, which are obviously connected to the starting materials. And... In this overview presentation, basically data and numbers and a little bit of the summary of what the model is like so that in the afternoon, everyone knows what Kadifas are, what is our scope, what are DIFAs, and Aitha is going to be talking about these demand items and how we're working to improve these submissions. So that's it, people. Thank you very much. I think that now we can go to lunch and we can have the questions in the afternoon. Is that okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Henangoy. So now we'll have our break for lunch, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll come back 
at 1 p.m. sharp. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome back. We ask you to take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a little change in the programming. We invite now to talk about a technical aspects, Mr. Ayrton Rocha from COIFA and Visa. Good afternoon. I'm Nayton, Nayton Flavio Mora Rocha. I work in COIFA. I'm a civil servant from uh, Visa for a while, almost 10 years. And what I'm going to talk about is to continue what Hannon mentioned in his last slides regarding the main uh, the, uh, exit items and talk about the technical aspects about the submission of GIF and CADIF in a Q&A way. Previously to this seminar, we request some questions to be sent to us and then we elaborate the answers. And that's a good way to talk about the technical aspects regarding GIF and CADIF. So, I'm not. Sh I'm sure that a lot of information here you know. So I'm sorry if I cannot go deeper in the subject or answer in the best way, but I'm going to try to give my best. As Renan mentioned on this slide, I'm going to start talking about the profile of the. The profile of the demands that we elaborate to the sector is distributed in numbers, 490 requests of additional information, items of regarding the description of the manufacture of APIs. I believe that because of the uh, the way that is request, a lot of companies do not send the way the documents the way we expect. So they got summarized, and that stop us to make a proper analysis. And that's important because in the productive process, the production of the summar summarized uh, route is submitted to GIFA. So we do this request, not only as a bureaucracy, we have to understand what is in the GIFA. So the 
the highest, the biggest point of request of our coordination regarding the analysis of CADIF. It's about the description of controls and process. And then we got research of impurities that are items that demand a reasonable time of analysis. And it had uh, has uh, some work to do. We have several guidelines regarding that, so the requirements some of those are new, so that should suffice somehow that we made a big amounts of demands regarding that, and then uh, raw material control. We got 299 uh, I regard this session, and it's related to the issues about the f definition of the start points material to us is a critical issue because of how fast it should be in the analysis. When we made this request about this item, that demand a reanalysis. So all the sectors need to understand that submits since the beginning in the correct way is also a way to be more efficient. So that's something that I would like to mention uh, from the start that the submission, the right submission to the documentation as expected, it's something that could improve the efficiency of the agency. And the stability is a session that we got a lot of requests. And here we can see that are some issues related to polymorphism and some things that that we deal in the most of submission and we don't don't see that as a rule so it's necessary the emission of requests the manufacturer manufacturing session The manufacturing session is a session that we request additional information because the uncertainty of the definition of matters, it needs to be changed. Control of intermediary stages. Those are the sections that in DIFA we do requests the most. Validation of analytic methods, it's a reasonable amount, but it, this used to be a worse bottleneck than nowadays. Justification of the inspection. So we have here the main ones, five main ones, sessions that are described, and we have a percentage that so one fifth of our requests are related to impurity and one fourth the discretion of the process of synthesis. Can you see the screen uh, in blue here? No, nothing. So I'm going to describe it. In the session S22, which the manufacturing one, we has as the main point of request that detailed description of the process. I'm sorry for the size of the letter. The, it's a point where we have a lot of uh, demand and the recovery of materials. So those sessions, we have emitted a lot of requests. They are the main one subsessions of the session as to two. So of course, we have an uh, issue related to that, and it's necessary to understand the way that we require this information. From the, the session about impurity, the big number of requests is uh, re related to mutual genic changes, transformation. So it's a point that we need to work better on that 
the session two three the uh, raw matter control to just just justify our points that we need to make requests so we need to understand what we need because what the guidelines requires the stability as a rule are not bottlenecks the structure understanding are the issues that we got more requests before that before going to the next item i would like to ask if is there any issue or any question to be clarified do you have any questions It's okay. Can we go forward? I think I'm going to fish, finish quicker than I thought. So we consider as important that the companies that are submitting information to us understand what is a synthesis road route is. That's a question that we got from several channels, and it, this that uh, means different uh, requests of CADIFA. That doesn't mean that necessarily we are going to analyze DIFAs that got some similarity. We can avoid that if the company signed that. It's in the handbook, CADIFA. But it's to understand what we uh, what we understand as something that's different. Synthesis routes substantially different. The ones that got processed with intermediary intermediaries. To simplify some cases, some cases very easy to see that when we got different intermediate. So these difference are subtle sometimes. So it requests a little more information. But if you have a rational uh, scheme that's considered uh, substantially condition, uh, there is different. So it justify the request. Just this, this is just to uh, show a case to show you. We have materials from start point uh, that are different. Even if you have a different intermediary, so it needs to be in a separate request of Kadifa. We also understand that as routes that could generate impurity prof profiles to the same A API. So if you have routes that not identify as substantially different, we don't have the clear view that the intermediaries are different. And somehow we can identify that the impurity profile from the I API is different, that possibly is a different route. So it needs to be uh, requested in a uh, separated justification. So bringing some more clear examples, when we have an introduction of a new solving, that's uh, something that's different. If you have a request of Kajifa to do, and there is a reaction diagram, and it's similar, but there is a different solvent, and it's not absent on the API, we do not consider, consider do not understand that's different. Even it's produced 
and it had as a, a subtle difference uh, we don't consider we don't understand as like that in the last uh, introduction of solvent in the last stage and that's because in the first condition I'm talking about to introduce a new solvent that's not absent from API we have two different routes and this difference of solvent it's the uh, the start uh, the f initial stage and if it's out of the API, it's not a condition to consider that's different. So uh, because the company uh, proved that uh, there wasn't this solvent in, at the start point. So Uh, all the companies that use the solvent as a catalyst that's different from other that's a different synthesis so uh, they have to got different requests a stereo level of a uh, APIs uh, prepared in a non stereo way we had different levels so it's different requests we can't have both on the same request because they are different a APIs, the same, a the same way, the contrary. When there is an addition of raw material uh, from animal origin in our routine, that's there is a synthetic API. It's very hard to happen. And what's not substantially a different route So to summarize what happens, what I want to say is to show what do we understand as a uh, route of synthesis uh, substantially different is when we have a clear vision from what's different. Other small things, as I mentioned, the difference in a solvent in a initial stage or absent or a difference in the react that don't have any impact on api it's not something that's substantially different that's a, not a different process you can have a request of kajifa using different places of manufacturing with the same route that's on in the kajifa Okay, can we go on? Any questions? I'm sorry, the interpretation can't hear. It needs to be on the mic so we can listen. I apologize, but uh, it's not on the microphone. I don't have everything by heart in my mind. I'm sorry. Maybe I should know, but I don't. So it's because the 1D from the 7.3 that has the condition 2.3.2, which allows that the change of the manufacture of API, including the quality control unit. So in the condition 1, the specification, including the controlling process and analytic methods and synthesis routes are identical to the approved ones. 
but I cannot imagine two manufacturers with everything identical. So what's the difference between substantially and identical? Let me answer you. These questions about uh, substantially different process comes from issues related to the submission of the request of different CADIFAs. That's the context that we want to put that, because there are requests of, of CADIFA that brings more than one uh, manufacturer. And sometimes we have uh, different intermediaries. And not always they use the same route. So we need to know if they could be or not in the same GIFA. So one of the conditions to allow the presence of these different manufacturers, it, the synthesis route is not substantially different. So this definition comes uh, in this sense. I can't say that's the same thing because it's written in our norm. If it's not, not clear about the intermediary, so it's not necessary the CADIFA. So how can we have another manufacturer with everything different and not identical? What's your name, Natalia? Natalia is saying that the change 232 of the annex 2 of 239 is the inclusion of the manufacturer. It's a condition to put that as a small one. If not accomplish the condition, they don't put inside it. So it's a minor for exclusion. It's a condition to accomplish this condition for the change. So we don't apply this change. So uh, it's one A or one D. I could go for exclusion from seven three. É porque. I'm going to bring that on the challenge presentation. There is a change of model. Before 359, we talked about the place of manufacturing. Now we have the owner of DIF. They could have three places. So that's applied to include the plants. So if you have a new DIF, it's 1A. If you are including a new place, then you come here, and then could be 1D. So our different concepts, we change the understand on manufacture. So it's a little bit about it. I'm going to bring that on the other presentation, and maybe we could come back with this question. So I understand that you can include in the same portfolio. But it's a new one, and then it's 1A. That's my question. It's very simple one. We have another question. I'm sorry, but it's very complicated. The new uh, regulatory landmark DFO is very complex. Good afternoon, Henrique. In the case that the API is micronized or not micronized, it, it, it should be two different CADIFAs. That's an issue that the owner of the GIFA that's going to decide if the level that it's be s selling is always micronized is going to have this specification. It's variable? No. It's not association to a specific degree. If the company makes the process of micronization, the test needs to be there, but the specification will be as usual, depending on the client. So that's it. There is no uh, link to that. On the other hand, we have got another situation, another situation and this micronized issue and particles happens in the discussion of the finished uh, product. So you're going to send the documentation in the dossier of the finished product. I'm no, I don't know if I'm clear. 
it's important. We receive a lot of questions related to that on the website and sometimes from other channels. So it's un uh, important to uh, define that. So uh, CADIFA is not associated to a macronized level. If they're buying uh, X level and it's make the associate CADIFA, so we can negotiate how this CADIFA is going to be requested by the CADIFA owner. If I have a manufacturer that CADIFA was uh, subscribed in a micronized and then they decide to purchase another one. Can I micronize that? CADIF is being emitted to a certain level. It is, um, the owner al already had it. They are going to request, they need to request or modify. Yes, it was, if we got an API, similar API, we can take this one to request a new one without this restriction. So they make a request saying that the GIF is similar to the previous previous one. So they are not good. They will not be reevaluated. Thank you. For the similar GIF, it's important the attach attach eight. These administrative things, Renan is going to talk about that. I don't know if he is going to be able to wait. Good afternoon, Diane, Dorxe Pharma. My question, it's regarding the MF in a processed API before used in the manufacture of the medicines. By who? by the pharmaceutical industry or the manufactured? You have the synthesize API. So it depends on the size of the particle to be used in the medicine manufacturing. The point is the Kadifa handbook talks about the synthesized APIs, the features, when it goes through any kind of processing that is relevant, the dose and the performance regarding the polymorphism. Is there a requirement that's more specific on this situation? It's very important. It's, it, this uh, answer is going to be ahead. Let me say something. This kind of information, if it's on the dossier that is going to analyze the standard, that expert is going to see if that impacts on the solid phases of the API. If it scribes on DIF, probably you're going to receive a demand a notification in saying what's the impact of that in two points, the features of solid phases and if the impact on the st stability of the API. It's not usual that to happen. So we do this kind of request. I don't know if you answer, if I answer. This case is not a micronization. It, the API has a size of particle which is different in a bigger scale and it's like a placebo effect regarding the synthesized API. What is add in the process? I understand, as from the information that I have, we have the handbook guiding how you should do that. And thinking about the way how it's the API is processed, it needs to present the performance from the doses. So I, my question is regarding the data of poly, polymorphism. It's a possible profile, the API itself. Good. 
just to make a cohort of the situation, everything that you are mentioned is very relevant, but we need to separate what's API information, where you what you're going to submit to the request, and what you're going to put in the information package to the registration of the finished product. It's a letter of adequation of the API between the emission of CADIF, the issue of CADIF, and the finished medicine, something could happen, but it's forbidden. And that's under the domain of the finished product. I'm saying that because I don't know if I'm answering your question, but the issue is if it's described in GIFA, some process, physical processing, something that impacts, I recommend that we need to, you need to start the discussion from the beginning. They have both stages. So I understand if we're going to understand the process API, we need to send this documentation, the whole process, right? But this part, the uh, feeling of that is not on the same points. It's like something finished. The processing stage happens inside the pharmaceut pharmaceutical. So it's part of the process if the, the, uh, the industry wants the level of quality. Uh, it, 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 that's it. Thank you. That's what I meant. Well, thank you. Thank you for your help. Point is, I ultimately understood it's not, it was not about the intermediate. Since it is within DIFA and not CADIFA, This dialogue is important uh, because Kadifa is a letter or a charter that shows the uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients. But in that situation, it will end. It's important to say that just because it is DIFA, it means it is the end. Just put in the package in the DIFA and that's it? No. We have the demand. We ask them to remove it and present it in, in the description of the medication. So we can have this situation because only because there is differ, it's not only that. I don't want to keep uh, the subject. We need to continue, but uh, it was just because the the information within differ. If it is part of the quality uh, degree, it should be in the differ. So there were many discussions, but I understood this, is, this was the scenario. Am I right? I'm Tiago from Globi Chimica, national manufacturer. Thank you for the opportunity, the availability. It was quite enriching. It has been quite enriching. Two slides uh, passed when you mentioned what would be the substantially uh, different route. In general, this first item, when you have, for example, the material, the starting material that is different, it is treated as a substantially different route. And then later, in a second item, you mention another change and talk about the absent, absence of the description of impurities. If you think of the uh, route of synthesis that is different, for example, item five, the, part, the starting uh, material, when you have two different uh, starting materials with different uh, purging controls or isolating of the three other intermediates that you had to, to reach the EFA, Considering that the three intermediates will be the same, uh, coming from different uh, starting materials, but with the, with the same route of, route of synthesis, in case you you are sure that the purity profile of the uh, the finished product is identical, would you take into consideration accepting these two routes within the same DIFA? I'm going to answer you saying that in a situation that you mentioned, I understand that it would be more productive to justify the selection of a starting material that is more advanced. 
I'm not talking. I'm not saying that it is correct, always correct. But if you have a route of synthesis that is long enough to say that what happens right in the beginning does not mean uh, doesn't have a relationship with or with what is in the end, if you, if you can have evidence for that, that could prove that the material is defining before it should. So if I were in a company, I would follow this path. I don't know if I should be saying that, but yeah, perfect. That was our understanding, actually. So I thank you for your answer. It was quite productive. Well, well. Interpretation service apologizes. The speaker is speaking out of the microphone. Can we have the IPA associated with another material? This is a re uh, recurrent question. Some companies ask that. To is it possible just to request Kadifa for this um, API with a different with another material? Yes, you can, but these are there are exceptional cases for that. You have the API uh, issued for, uh, but you need to f follow some criteria. When there is an elevated interaction with the synthesis of the API, that won't be a case. There are two cases I have in, in my mind that this exchange happens in in that stage of crystallization. So some APIs are provided with lids, and maybe you, you will remember some of them. And this adjuvant, this material that is with the uh, API, it is added in the in the phase of crystallization and purification. So in that case, it all happens in the ph uh, pharmacochemical company. So you can have the uh, API, but it is not an intermediate product, okay? It's an exception. There is an elevated degree of uh, interaction with the synthesis of the API. If it is in a association that is described in the in the biography, in the bibliography, it's okay. There is another case that is important. There are some APIs that they not necessarily need to be associated or dissolved. In, a, in any circumstance to increase the stability or the safety. So in that in these cases, that are purely exceptions, I have to highlight that, it is necessary to have this association, the association of the API. But in no circumstance or in no moment, I, I want to emphasize that because my boss is here in front of me, because we're not talking about intermediate products. I'm talking about ex uh, exceptional cases with elevated degree uh, it, it happens within the farm, pharmacochemical company. So you you would constitute one DIFA and then request for a DIFA when there is a unit, um, manufacturing unit of the API. In that case, you will only, you only link it to the DIFA of the uh, incipient API. Also, I'd like to go back here a little bit. In, in the case that is uh, completely, completely necessary for stability and, and, and safety of the API. And I'm, I can say it is true. It's important to make it clear that the association that is being proposed and that is occurring in the pharmacochemical unit, it is in the scope of the authorization. It really is completely necessary for the stability and safety of the API. So you cannot use it as, a, as an excuse to have an intermediated product. I don't know if it's clear to you, but it is important because we have received different questions about that. It is the point of view for the request of Kadifa. In other areas in which if there is a question about that, you have to, to get in touch with the area uh, with the goal of having inspections. So we're talking about specifically about the request for Kadifa. Do you have any question? Distribution test of the size of particles. When it is carried out in a third party laboratory, this laboratory will have to be described in the section 322F of DIFA, 
well, the different needs uh, the laboratory that of control quality control and distribution of particles have to be in the list of differ. It has to be, and then I have to repeat this. We, we're talking about the request of Kadifa. So this is the scope that I am talking about. At Difa, if you have a manufacturer that is a unit A and you have the quality control unit B, it has to be described at, at Difa. This item here is important. In the beginning of the presentation, I demonstrated which were the points in which the agency has the biggest demands. And the first one was description sections for the, the synthesis process. This is the question here. What is the expectation of the agency for the um, compliance with the narrat sequential narrative? So we, what we expect to receive? Well, before anything, we need to receive the narrative of the process in a very clear way, in, a, in an understandable way, in a way that we can understand the sequence of information and the sequence of unitary operations in this differ. So to avoid uh, postponing the approval uh, due to demands, this uh, request has to be the narrative of the of the manufacturing uh, process with the different parameters of the process that, that is temperature, pH, and how the reactions happen in the pr productive process. Also, you need to have the ranges and the amount of raw materials used in industrial batches. So it has to be in the CADIFA request. This is really necessary to do the association on what is the DIFA holder? The DIFA holder is the one who has the knowledge of the information that is being provided. So all this information can only be provided through the holder. So narrative of the uh, manufacturing process, including process parameter, the amount of raw material, and to av avoid V uh, vague expressions such as uh, overnight uh, production, no. And identification of critical steps and uh, controls. If you follow this, you will not have problems uh, with requests related to this session. So and it's going to be good because we have lots of demands on that. And this, se this section, it's uh, hard working for us to evaluate. So what I'm saying is when you do the submission of information, check if what is being submitted is according to what is, what is demanded. So also the information on the batch. So there is an important information when you have the reuse of, when you have this type of operation, you need to describe it. It has to be very clear. And many times, the quality equivalences have to be in the DIFA. Obviously, when the DIFA is st uh, sterilized, you need to present the description of sterilization process. All I told you now, uh, in a nutshell, is submit the narrative of the process in a way that the person who reads will understand it very well, will not only understand the synthesis of the, the product, but also the impurity section, uh, they will tell you this impurity is impossible because this process has X washes. This impurity is impossible because my process has washing with uh, ethanol, acetone, and is and centrifugated. So the specialist who will evaluate that will see that, will check that. They, they need to have the narrative of the process in a correct way. What, I, what I'm telling you here is we do the analysis in a way that we need to search for information to validate what you're saying. So the impurity section, it is not only bureaucratical or administrative. There is an analysis. For us to analyze uh, certain arguments, we need to understand the process. So uh, summarizing, this is it. How can we reduce the demands? It is even funny. It's one of the ways, one of the things that we hear the most is 
to reduce the demand. But the sector that is sending information needs to help us. You, if you send it the way it should be, it's going to work well and it, it will avoid demands. In the case of providing the full chart of the manufacturing process, it is important as well because for a long time submissions were done only from of the open part. If it's, it's a pharmaceutical common, uh, company, you only have access to the information regarding the open part. They understood that the full chart of the process was just three, four um, boxes with information, but it is not that. As a matter of fact, it is a way to make the narrative of the process more understandable. The full chart of the process is nothing but the flow in which on the left hand side you have the input of material and that, that has to be clear. In the center you have the unit operation that is happening. In this unit operation you have, I'm saying because I, I know you cannot read here, so I'm listing this. Everything that is written there is what I'm saying here. The flow chart has to be clear. The information regarding the synthesis process have to be clear. The introduction order should be clear. For example, it's not possible for us to receive the process flow chart information that is too simplified. We need to have the the use order of those ingredients in the process, it has to be clear. The unit, unit uh, operation has to be clear. The conditions of the process have to be clear. The outlet of the process has to be clear as well. For, for example, uh, input is on the left-hand side, the unit uh, operation in the center, and on the right-hand side, the outlet. What I'm saying is these two last slides that, that I showed to you, basically, and I'm talking about the topic that we had many demands at COIFA. It is important indeed. And believe it or not, the information are not minimally uh, explained to be assessed. So the expectation of the agency re regarding the process and the flow chart of the, f of the manufacturing are the ones I just described. Well then, another topic that it's very common, it's uh, regarding the um, recovery of material and solvents. The synthesis process of the API uses solvents. What are the information for different that have to be uh, described regarding these, these recovered materials? So first of all, what is the range of use of these uh, solvents and where they come from and where they are reintroduced? We need to know this. Sometimes the company uses 100% of recovered solvent. That's okay, as long as the correct information are provided. We need to know that it is clear. We use residual solvents in uh, up to 100% of the cases. All right, but what is the specification of this recovered solvent? It is the same one of the fresh solvent. If the specification of the recovered solvent is the same of, of the fresh solvent, and it is reintroduced in the same step that is recovered, the level of information that we request is minimum because we understand that if I, if I have a recovered solvent and it has the same specification and it is being reintroduced in the same step where it is recovered, basically we need to have this inf very information. And also, the recovery process should, should be described in, a, in some, some way. This is one of the items of demand that we have. And it is important because sometimes it may not be very important in terms of the Kadifa, but in, in practical terms, it has to be well regulated, well done. And depending on the solvent is taken, taken out and reintroduced, that there can be a change in the purity. So two things are, several things are necessary, proportion, the place where the sol solvent is recovered and reintroduced, and specification compared with the fresh solvent. And then what we have is, in general terms, when the specification of the solvent and materials are uh, equal or more restrictive, restrictive to the ones uh, fresh, it's not necessary to have additional information. 
On the other hand, when the specification of the solvent and recovered material is divergent, in that case, yes, you need to provide more information. You need to have the assessment of quality. To, you will have to compare the produced API with the fresh solvent and the API produced with the recovered solvent. And there's another point here that can be a demand from us. Sometimes the companies recover materials, sometimes the companies do that, and the specification of the material, the recovered material, is very different from the fresh solvent. It's really completely different. It's 80, 90% of purity. In these cases, it is necessary to have a comparison of the API obtained through fresh materials and recovered materials. However, the recovered materials, materials used, they have to be used after the results of worst case scenario analysis. And I don't know, I don't know if you all understand what I'm talking about. You need to produce the API with the recovered material in the worst case scenario. If the, if the specification of the recovered material is 90% of purity, you will have to produce it 90% of purity. But these cases, they are more rare. Normally, the comparison is com it comes from the uh, results of analysis of the API, fresh API, the API produced with fresh material, and the one produced with recovered material. Is it easy to understand? Is it clear to you all? All right. Great. Well, I'll go back to the slide here. Just to make it clear to you, when the specification of solvents and recovered materials are the divergent, we need to justify the specification of the recovered materials, the uh, batch analysis, and the batch analysis of the recovered material uh, regarding the equivalence of recovered material and the quality of recovered material and the quality of fresh materials. Well, since you understood this clearly, this question becomes easier. Currently, there is a reprocessing uh, in, a, in a very uh, frequent way of the synthesis of steps of API. What are the steps? Uh, the question says that it is, it is a frequent, uh, it is frequent to have the reprocessing of materials, and they're asking about the steps. If it's a routine, it is a process. So it has to be described in the process. If it's frequent, if you always do the, the reprocessing, we have to understand that, understand that it is part of the process. The company can use some kind of control in the process to repeat a step or not. If it's part of the routine, it is process. If it's not routine, in the case where uh, the reprocess is not part of the routine. The company has to accept that the reprocessing is the repetition of a certain step. For example, the repetition of the crystallization process. In that case, it is important to understand if it, what is happening is really reprocessed. The reprocess does not change anything. You just reintroduce the intermediate or the API in, a, in, a, in the previous uh, stage, and then it has to be very clear. To us at COIFA, if the company doesn't mention any kind of reprocess, we understand that they not they do not do it. Just to make it clear to you, you have to be sure that the procedure is really a reprocess. I will not repeat what I just said. So the introduction of an API, API or an intermediate in a previous step. So I think. Everybody understands it clearly. The point of the question is, if it is a routine, you should describe it in the process. Guys, am I speaking fast? Is it OK? You can understand. I'm not talking fast, right? Maybe this point is one of the most important ones. The, for the initial submission in the right way. I have to make it very clear to you. The definition of starting material is something that gives a lot of rework to us. If you want the queue to move faster, 
it's submitted at least on the side of Goifa, if you submit a uh, starting material in the correct way, you are helping very much. Because I'm quite aware that it is something that gives us rework. Uh, to this extent that one initial analysis can be a, that can be a notification of a demand has three rounds of notification of demand because when you define a, the starting material you include new information you include new manufacturers and then practically you are submitting a new dos dossier so it is important if if you are working strongly in the efficiency matter you have to work in the submission the definition of the starting material. I think it was very clear on uh, who are the uh, holder of the DFAs. These people are not here, but it is important that this communication is done and this inf information should reach them. Because not always this process can be efficient. Well, what do we expect? concerning the fulfillment of the CH key 11 principles for the starting materials. This is what I just told you, it is very important, and so on. The starting material, the main points about it to be observed. First point. It is not acceptable the having the starting material of one point of the route of synthesis that there, in which there is no chemical transformation. It is basic. There must be chemical transformation after the introduction, introduction of the uh, starting material. Um, you cannot only have the description of technical steps. The starting material ha has to necessarily be a substance or material that is chemically well-defined, well-characterized. Um, not long ago, after the legal framework, we had submissions of DFAs in which the starting material were mixes, mixtures. And it is not acceptable. The starting material that, that is defined has to be characterized as an isolated substance. What am I talking about when I say mixtures? We can have a starting material that is liquid and, and soluble where we have a purity of 60% and a purity profile in which some impurities are up to 10%. We've already seen that. That's not possible. We can't treat that. We, don't, we can't admit that. Even if we have transformation steps, these are rare cases, but they do happen. And so the starting material needs to be uh, have defined properties and isolated materials can't be considered adequate materials if they impact purity of the IPA. This will be included in section S22. Definition of starting materials should be connected to the pro, uh, impurity profile of the IPA. So if you have in the specification of the IPA impurities that derivate from steps that are not described, in the dossier, it is possible that we have a demand for the redefinition of the starting materials because we have steps that impact on the purity profile of your active ingredient that aren't there on the CADIFA under, uh, or on the, rather under the DIFA request. So if we're analyzing the suggestion of starting materials, you need to verify where the purity profile of your IPA comes from. The steps of where these impurities can come from need to be described in the EPA profile, uh, the deep fuzz. So that's our expectation. So we should have a synthesis step. We should have multiple synthesis steps. The starting material should be a substance that is characterized with a defined profile. The impurities of the IPA should be, API should be uh, described in the DIFA. 
that is impurities that come from before the starting materials can lead to the possibility of the redefinition of the starting material. Another important aspect is the issue of structural fragments. During some time, companies had understood that the starting materials should be at least half of the API because this was a significant frag uh, structural fragment. The idea of the significant uh, fragment is to differentiate it from a reagent. So when if you have a synthesis route and you have the starting materials that will become the framework of the molecule, then you have reagents which might not be that. So these reagents don't need to be defined as starting materials. So the issue of the stru significant structural fragment is just to differentiate what are starting materials and what are reagents. So our expectation basically is that the definition of starting materials summarizing it's what I've said. Multiple synthesis steps substance that is well characterized it should be connected to the impurity profile of the api itself you cannot it may just the technical steps so it's important to have this analysis i would say that today it's practically impossible well it's very rare it's very rare to have a starting material with just one synthesis step and one purification step it's very very rare and that is restricted to very simple molecules, so multiple synthesis steps. That's something very important. So just to summarize of what I said, basically we covered over half of all the, the demands that we have. If we have the correct definition of the starting material, and if you have a correct description of the synthesis process, a lot of things connected to the Kadifa are okay, and you have a reduction in the number of total demands. In relation to the starting material, something else that's important to keep in mind is the specification because oftentimes we understand that since it's a starting material, then you can have a very wide reaching, wide encompassing uh, 10 to 15 percent of impurity, total impurity with very little specific impurities that are being controlled. That's not good and it's not uh, to be admitted. So you need to justify. You need to justify the specifications of your starting material. And to justify your starting material, the specifications of your starting materials, that is, it's important that companies provide batch analyses of APIs that were produced with that starting material at that specification that was proposed. That is an evidence that that starting material is being well defined and that those specifications lead to the uh, uh, production of the pharmaceutical material that is in the uh, desired quality. So these need to be justified. I said that there were acceptance criteria for impurities that are controlled in the starting materials within the criteria that are contained in the CIH are considered justified. This doesn't mean that we need to have ICH defined limits in the starting materials. What's being said here is that if you have a starting material in which a given unidentified uh, impurity is being controlled to 0.10%, you don't need to explain that much. That's what we mean. This is just a way to have a comparison basis. When the specification of the starting material are too wide, then you have to explain the specification, and then you will have to, as a rule, produce uh, an indication with the starting material at those specifications. And, of course, One of the biggest demands is that companies oftentimes send the impurity section of the API, but they don't actually analyze the starting materials for impurity. So it is also necessary to evaluate the mutagenic potential of impurities that come from the starting materials. And here we also have an issue of analysis, not just a document issue. The more, the farther away your starting material is, from the final API, the less you will have to explain the specification of the impurity profile. Why? Because the, those impurities which are there in the starting material will have the quantity of operation units to be eliminated. 
So it is important to take into consideration the issue of synthesis steps and purification steps to justify the specification of the starting material. And the impurities of the starting materials should also be evaluated in the triage of the mutagenic material. I'm not going to go further into detail because otherwise we'll only leave tomorrow morning. The capacity of the you need to be able to detect impurities in, in the starting materials manufacture process. This is something that we don't really analyze that much, but because the analytical methods for starting materials, we don't, as a rule, we don't do such a criteria analysis at the end of the day. So the justification of the specifications of the starting materials should really come from batch analyses and written uh, justifications and the analysis of the mutagenic potential of the impurities. And something else, uh, the, oh, I forgot what, what the next thing was, but sometimes we demand that APIs, which are asymmetrical molecules, uh, that is, chirals have their quality controlled in the specification of the APIs. However, it is possible that when the process doesn't change a given molecule, it is possible that the hysterical issue of the molecule is ba controlled based on the starting material. But this is something that must be described that that specific process does not change the stereochemical chemistry of the molecule. In some cases, it's important to have some kind of control in the end because we can't just be based on what's written. So it is important to control the starting materials as far as the issue of stereoisometrics, stereoisomerics. And we have certain description that their synthesis processes don't change anything in terms of the spatial isomery that is controlled in the starting materials. I'm sure that you know what I'm talking about. But this needs to be very clear in your submissions. Well, just a question. Have you understood what's being said in relation to starting materials and what's being said in relation to the description of the synthesis process? This is really important, OK? Because as I've said, these are the biggest points of demand for us. So I consider that today, you're understanding the expectation of the agency in relation to what we want to receive. Since everyone's quiet, it's necessary to characterize the polymorphic form for the APIs, which are only used and has been completely dissolved in the preparation of medications. No. However, the company needs to make that very clear. So let's say you have a certain API that is only used, that is, it's associated to a medication that's a solution, and it's only used uh, solubilized, you don't need to characterize the polymorphic form because that's not a quality attribute. However, it's important to make the following very clear. Everyone here has seen a Kadifa. Have you seen the document Kadifa? Have you seen what's at the very end? There are some informations there that are quite important. So every DIFA, that is when you're requesting a CADIFA, it has an understanding that if it's doing an association uh, with a given medication in which an API is going to be used in a completely soluble manner, but the API can be used in another pharmaceutical preparation in which it's not going to be used in a soluble way, it's important for that to be very clear because if you have that the Kadifa and the information, then you're going to have a little message saying that the attributes of polymorphism attributes were not considered critical. So what happens when you get to GQMed and you present the Kadifa, then the GQMed Specialists will say, look, this Kadifa here, it's saying that the solid attributes were not considered critical. However, in this process, this is not a, a solution. It's a pill. So this is going to be a problem. So this needs to be very clear. I don't know if everyone understood what I said, but so if you have the possibility of soluble used or in solid use. It's important for us to have this information so that when we analyze, we consider this and that the Kadifa 
so that we can have the, uh, the most amount of kadifas possible. I know, well, we're not a pharmacochemical. I know that a lot of the things is in the restrictive parts, and we don't even have access to that. Are, are these solutions that are important for the manufacturers to uh, update? Are they going to be a COIFA guide with those questions and answers at the end? Because at the end of the day, we, uh, uh, we guide the uh, manufacturers to talk about the COIFA guide, and a lot of the things are not there. So they said, well, oh, where did you get the information? Uh, we get a lot of answers like that. I think I'm not the only one, right? Yeah. Well, then they say, no, well, wh where is it written down? And then you say that a visa is slow to analyze it. And I'm telling you about the reality. My colleagues agree. Okay. So, I don't know. Do you have any idea? Don't be mad at me. We want your help because if you put this down in the COIFA guide, then we can say, listen, this is written down in the visa's website. All right, so we're working. Can I say that, Hannah? Is that okay? I'm sorry, okay? It's because I'm a little nervous, so we kid around a bit to try and relax. No, seriously. We're working on a Q&A that's a little more extensive, actually a lot more uh, material on the Q&A, but it's a little bit complicated because there are certain things, there are details, there are interactions with other sectors in the agency, so it's not something that's very easily done. Even speaking here, we have to be careful to not touch on the competence of another sector. So we're working on a wider Q&A. We just want to ask you for some calm, but it's nearer rather than farther away for us to publish this. And it's also going to be translated into English. So I think it will be a good technical guide. And that's it. We, we'll have that. We'll, we'll make that available. And yes, we understand that the information are from the DIFA detainer, so that's why we say that the DIFA holder, they're the ones who have all the information for the IPA, uh, the API, sorry, uh, that's who we interact with. But I think it's very important, and I declare my insignificance of knowledge of how this interaction works between pharmacochemicals and pharmaceutical industries. I think that's very important for us to have the uh, channels of communication. I don't know how to work, but we're also here to, for, for that. We have requests that are under analysis for Kadifas, but you're sending the information on the half, and you say that it's half, and that you're, you're waiting for a visa to make the demands. No, I'm already saying things that I shouldn't say, but and I apologize for that. So we're working so that next year we'll have that new version of the questions answered. I think a good amount of the material comes from from this draft. And well, last year or this year we actually worked with an internal evaluation material that we're going to be uh, publicizing to you. We're going to have to have some filters. We're going to have an external version as well. So maybe in the second semester of next year. And then we'll have all of that. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your question. A very frequent question. When do we need to have polymorphism characterization in the API uh, description? Uh, Visa is a part of ICH. We have something in ICH saying exactly where something is a quality critical attribute. Uh, if it is a, a critical attribute for quality, then polymorphism needs to be in the pharmaceuticals uh, description 
it should be if it's characterized as being controlled. So we hope that you have understanding in this decision tree. So when it's not a critical quality attribute, then it's not necessary as a rule to have that control. Well, if it is necessary to have a characterization of the polymorphic form, what data should be provided? Well, the main technique for analysis of polymorphism is X-ray diffraction. So that's nothing new. We need that information. We need the polymorphic form that is being discussed be well characterized. We need the patent information in the scientific literature. They need to be described. It's also an important issue that sometimes the company just say it's form two or three and don't actually say which one it is. You need to say it, you need to say what patent it is, where it's coming from, and also the comparison, which is something that historically has been sort of loose. They say it's form X, they send three batches that are characterized, and that's that. I mean, that's not exactly it. You need to say, according to our results, our results suggest that it's this or that form, and we need to have that comparison. So. Obviously, if the specialist is able to do this relation, then they're not going to do. We're not going to do any sort of demand. But if you want this to be very clear, then you have to cite the patent and do the comparison there because maybe the specialist that's evaluating they might find an issue. They might ask for an, uh, for something that they could have already uh, 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 put down. So. When a polymorphic form is a quality critical attribute, then it must be put in. And to characterize the polymorphic form, then you must have a bibliographical references, experiments, and that all of this needs to be very clear in the API dossier or DIFA. The, we need to evaluate the robustness of the productive process, which needs to be verified in the three uh, batch sequence. You can characterize this with just three batches, but before you need to use techniques such as X-ray diffraction of in the powder of these batches and provide this information to us together with the information of what polymorphic form is being provided. And the stability of the polymorphic form needs to be verified when it is a quality critical attribute that is the specification for stability if it's a quality critical attribute, we need to have those specifications. Well, this is what I just said, that the stability of the polymorphic form can be evaluated during the stability study. Well, I think I've already answered this, which is in relation to the particulate distribution when you have more than one. The API that is produced can be commercialized in different distributions. So what should be presented in the DIFA? I already said uh, a lot about this when the DIFA is commercialized, it's different. This information must be clear in sections 3213. So it should be there that it depends on the consumer or it depends on the client or in case the API is submitted to any physical process for the reduction of part particle sizes, and it's already been mentioned here that we should have the description of this process in section S22 and the discussion on the impact on polymorphism and stability. That's basically what we already commented on in the beginning of this presentation. It's important to mention as well that in the cases of an acceptance criteria for the distribution of particles be variable in the specification of the API, we should have uh, this uh, very well described or as variable or depends on the client. Kadifa is not linked to a specific particle size distribution unless the DIFA holder wanted to. If it, they wanted to, yes. If no, no. So that's it. I think we should already have answered many FAQs in this sense. And yes, the answer is very clear. Things just need to be clear in the DIFA for us to do this because these informations are already connected to the performance of the API in the medication. So issues related to polymorphism and other issues are there in the package of information sent during the registration of this drug. So 
if you have a standard degree and then the criteria for the particle size and should be specified and so there will be a link to the Kadifa if the company wants, if the holders want. What's my time like? This point is something that's been worse to deal with, but it's now a easier. When the API is recognizing pharmacopias connected, uh, uh, recognized by Invisa, which are the Brazilian, European, and American pharmacopia, we need to have a complete description of the impurities, not only the uh, impurities in the reference material. The answer is yes, we do not accept the following declaration. My API is in this or that pharmacopoeia, and the impurities are the ones described therein. This will create a huge demand. You will have to fulfill a bunch of extra documentation. It's better for you to just send it in the first place. So what's the issue here? We know that the, these monographs are based on a given product or a given API, which is not necessarily the one that you're submitting in the Kadifa. So it's essential for the impurity profile to be uh, analyzed even if these APIs are in monographs and recognized pharmacopias. So the answer is yes. Pharmacopia monographs on different APIs are not enough to, to for you to not have an API on, uh, not have uh, uh, an analysis of the API. So what do we, do we want? We have a report of potential and real impurities that are well described. So in all the DFAs, we should present a detailed discussion with all of the potential impurities coming from the fabrication process, starting with potential impurities, then we need to look at their destination and elimination. This is independent of it being recognized by countries that are analyzed or, or that aren't we see a lot of different difficulties in obtaining the same API, so it is absolutely impossible. No, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it's improbable that a monograph is able to encompass a whole purity profile. It's not uncommon for us to have additional impurity tests, or in some cases, the company would rather use an internal method because a pharmacopoeia method might not be the best method for that product. And there's no problem at all, as long as the method is validated and that the discussions are complete and that the impurity sections, the impurity section deals with agent catalyzers, the product solvents, other raw materials and degradation products. This clicker is not good. And the elimination of all this control and the proposals of acceptance criteria. So just to wrap up, what do we want to have this? We want the company to know all the potential impurities. Based on the potential impurities, then they will describe the ones that are real. Based on those that are real, well, they should be controlled. If the monograph that is recognized is able to control the profile of those real impurities, if not, then the company will need to have one or two additional tests. The issue of the impurity session needs to be understood in a macro way. Since we have different ways to obtain the same API, we have various forms with the various impurity profiles, and this needs to be investigated whether you have a monograph or not. The reagents, catalyzers, uh, solvents, and raw materials, this starts from the very starting materials. If the materials are too upfront, then we might not uh, demand this, but in general, you will need these uh, informations. You probably want to speak, right? Sorry. So obviously, we need to discuss all of these impurities, including metagenic impurities. And if you have unspecified uh, impurities as well, well, this is something. I'm going to be very honest with you. When we're analyzing the DFA, we're separating things. Our way to analyze to analyze is basically like what's in the CTD and those kinds of sessions. And basically in my head, that's sort of like a checklist for you. It's very logical. In the CTD sessions, we have space for all of this. This all needs to 
be there. We have a guide for elementary purity, specified and unspecified purity. And this is in the gate CH key three A, which has a few years now, and this is all dealt with in the uh, impurity section B, the IP API monograph or not. Even in APIs that have monographs, you need to have this sort of presentation. You need to follow the ICH guide, the Q3A guide for unspecified purities and limits of identification. So when the monograph is a little bit weird, we suggest and ask that you adequate to the 3A guide. If a given impurity has a limit in the monograph, then we're not going to question it because it's already uh, identified. But if they're not identified, then we have these limits in QH3A. Hello, how are you? My name is Jacqueline. I'm from Nortec Pharmachemistry. You thought there was no one from Pharmachemistry, huh? Well, I wanted to go back a little bit to the topic on uh, grain size. So, also has to do with the question from my colleague. When the DIFA holder already has a CADIFA with a grain size specification that was carried out according to the manufacturer of the medication, and now this guy wants to associate the CADIFA to another manufacturer, but this other manufacturer doesn't want this grain size profile. They don't even want to do grain size analysis. Couldn't you change the Kadifa? Maybe make this very well described in the DNF. Seeing that you have different specification for two clients in this case, uh, in uh, changing the Kadifa, would it really be necessary to have a different Kadifa for the same product? And just before you speak, if we suppose that in both forms we have a stability study that is already concluded and quite advanced. In that case, that's not a case that we exactly foresaw because you're taking away a test in an approved. Uh, you're going to keep on doing that for that client, but you will provide to another client one in which you're not going to use that. It's like if you have two different specifications, one with grain size analysis and one without it. That's exactly what I wanted to talk about when I said that thing with the standard uh, grade. So I'm just going to say that in this case with Nortec, the ideal was to have described in the DIFA that the specification was depending on client. Why? For the CADIFA, there wouldn't be a specification. You would simply have the test saying it depends on the client. So you could provide any specification and it will already be evaluated. We will have evaluated the impact, the stability, and the polymorphics. It would all be there. So I'm not going to say it's a failure because it's a long procedure, something new. And so you, you requested for uh, a grade and then you didn't take. This isn't a case that's mine. I just want to take advantage of our questions of our, our colleagues. Since we already do grain size analysis for some APIs, it may be that in the future we find a, uh, an issue like this. And now I'm going to have to come to my side a little bit. This is a pressure that we suffer from the client. They want that information to be there and not an open uh, specification, you know? Okay, I confess that I'm trying to process a way to, to deal with this, and then you might help me with this, okay? Uh, what I can see as the most efficient way, the way that you're proposing it, if someone wants to be the Kadifa holder, but you want to have another specification, would be to do a new request, basically with an identical Difa, the similar Difa issue that we that's in the Kadifa manual, we basically won't have analysis just of the changes, and then you have two different Kadifas. So in this point, I think you have two Kadifas, and that would meet your needs, because you have a similar Difa, and the analysis on that would be minimal, so it would be a very small analysis. You say that you already have stability studies on the on the EFA and everything, so this kind of analysis should be very fast. So if you want to have both, 
what I'm imagining is the most efficient is using the procedure of similar DFA. So you petition for a new Kadifa and you say then the FB, I think it's on Annex 8 or something like that. When they talk about comparison, we have an approved Kadifa and we're only changing this. We want a new Kadifa. So I think that in that case, that would probably be the most efficient. Of course, we have a queue. We're going to take a while to analyze. Well, I think that's the larger one. Well, every analysis is going to take a while anyway. So, well, it just gives us a feeling like when you leave it open, like it will depend on commercial conversation with the client. Then you have a less critical situation because you're not doing the stability in all the different micronization possibilities for every client at that point in time. No. As a rule, we ask for the worst case scenarios. Yeah, but we understand that if you already have a Kadifa with a micronization process and you already carry out all the studies of a product that wasn't micronized, but that you might compare to, well, from the technical point of view, I completely understand what you're saying. It's basically the same product if they have the same stability, but it's basically the same problem with a different process in the end. I understand, but you must understand, we have no way to rectify a Kadifa like that. So it's not an error, it's a review. So we need to have an analysis anyway. The idea is that the way that you put it seems to be more efficient to have to keep the one you have and have another one. So the ideal would be that you had described this and well, this and uh, this whole situation in the defaults. Listen, our particle size specification depends on the client. So, and the Kadifa will just have a uh, something saying on the on the test. It depends on the client, and when they're associated to GQMed, they can use whatever way they want it. So, in the Kadifa, you can do this proactively, increasing your range. your possibilities for clients. Oh yeah, this kind of situation also happens. This didn't happen then our tech, but it is uh, also worth to us because we also always micronize products, but there's so many new situations for us which end up awakening some sort of doubt sometimes. We talked a lot about the definition of starting materials and we had a request for uh, starting material definition and so we really had a very different understanding from the agency because our product was a product that came from fermentation. So our provider delivered a fermentation product to us that was already uh, a chemical product was already fermented that was done initially by fermentation. So we initially defined as a starting material this fermentation purified product that I was going to call X, which was a well characterized substance. The structure is a part of the API. But after this product, this X product, we only had one more step, which was to make the product more basic. And so the agency understood that we had, we didn't have enough steps to call this. Uh, product the starting material so there's a new confusion if it is the intermediary who is the starting material is it my fermentation broth who what is the starting material then we started to talk to ask for a conversation with the agency to try and understand what the the understanding is as far as uh, this company we need to redefine the microorganism for the uh, uh, starting material well exactly this discussion is concluded then because I think there's already guidance. I'm not going to remember exactly where it is. I'm sorry, but I think the guidance would come from the precursor, maybe the fermentation. Well, we had a cell bank. Well, in that case, that's it. But since it was a very different product that we'd never worked with something like that, we're always used to chemicals. We think, well, this product of fermentation is our starting point because this idea that we should have a part of our structure in the final API. How, if we're talking about a bacteria, if we're talking about fermentation, it's impossible for us to know this. And 
so I'd like to thank you for this uh, 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 availability, but I'd like to thank you for your availability, but this is essential for us to have this understanding and this uh, all this learning. Okay, I'm going to make a few comments here, but at the end of the day, I have a very sincere question. Did you understand or, the, or agree with the agency understanding? Yes, we didn't see that. So when we went to the meeting, we were like, oh, my God, it's not possible. And in the conversation as it went on, it, things became clearer and clearer, and everything's okay now. Well, I don't have a lot more to add other than what you said, but this is just a consideration just so that you understand uh, that we're still learning a lot how to interact with that and we need to have information to justify we don't have the know-how to do this so little by little we're walking forwards and learning the same way that you're learning especially in the administration as administrative issues and in some more spiny issues as far as the technical point of view nothing stops the things that are happening i'm saying here that there we might have a changing understanding in a year or so because it is a learning process it's a regulatory framework which is modern there's very few agencies that work in this way and we even see that this might not be in the best way but it will certainly be the more efficient way to do things in the future so have everything having everything concentrated in there with the gfa holder having this conversation with you what is the definition of starting materials on and so forth it's an opportunity to learn from uh, from other companies, uh, from technical learning for the pharma chemicals. I'd like to thank you that you agreed with us. So that's great. No, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to say that pharma chemicals are here. You thought we didn't have any pharma, ch pharma chemicals. You wanted to say that we're not here. Yes, we are here. We have someone from Torrent as well. Listen, if you're buying with Nortec Chemica, you, you can ask for anything you want. Anything that's not an industrial secret. And industrial secrets, those are parameters. Things that we can't reveal. Other than that, you can ask Nortec Chemica for whatever you want. If you can talk about as a suggestion of, of, for the agents in those cases, he, she has a case that wants to correct, but we have a guideline of what to do in those cases when the request depends on the client. Somehow, I talked about that. When we depend on the client, you need to say that very clear in the correct session, but with the indication that depends on the client. A part of this processing of the stability. So that's our suggestion. I don't know if you have any other thing. I would like to talk about Kajifa. First, this test is going to be a routine or an additional test. If you don't want to close a acceptation criteria, depends on what the client wants. So suggestion let's put that as an additional test if it doesn't have a specific test so you could attend everybody several ranges the guidance that we give is work like that it should not put any limits in all the discussion that we mentioned. Hi, I'm Sarila. I just talking about in this case, we have a proposal. We wanted to validate if it's possible. This issue, we had a condition issued with a special particle to avoid make a new Kajifa, an identical 
similar one. It could be done a post register and uh, to extend the criteria because nowadays the legislation allows that. Thinking on that case that we already have. The comment is, I had something deal with the client. Client, I want to extend to other client to have Kadifa to both. Can I extend doing a post registration and send all the necessary documents? Is to amplify the criteria. Is there then ask for a new Kadifa? I don't know. It's going to be on the line of post register. But if you are going to request a new Kajif, maybe it took longer. Just to take the previous case, I understood that you want to stay because somebody wanted that. I'm sorry, can we hear, can hear because it's not on the mic. So I think it's better if you have, if you, we have a side talk. Uh, to compare my registered uh, manufacturer, but I could attend other. But uh, you still have the same Kajif in the case w w that some client wants to. It's another case. We got several opportunities to uh, extend the criteria. It's possible if you can match with other one. I'm leaving. 90 less than 100, 90 less than 600. I'm extending what I want to offer to my client in a more closed uh, specification. In the point of view, what's critical or not? Can you understand my point of view? Because what you will call an extension and a particle, it's not something that's direct we can include that somehow so it could be a possibility it could be pleat if you can fit that on the changes just a suggestion to the debate it's just as i say that those are new things I confess that I don't have all the changes on my hand, I had, and uh, it's good. I like to think ahead, looking at the norm. Something happens more, and then we can think quickly about that. But I like to look uh, matching with the norm. Thank you, and I'm sorry if I couldn't respond to that. So when one starts, everybody comes. I have three questions. Regarding this granulometry, the ground and the micronized can i the micronized it's the worst case you put more energy in the process you're going to have a more uh, superficial area that's bigger yeah we have to 
So that's my worst case. The second item that you comment, on the contrary uh, from what you comment, we were question why we are following not not the IDH. Can you specify a little bit more? Because, for example, it's very clear on the agencies that impurity is specification from the pharmacal area. You need to say where it comes from, and then we approve. But there are some APIs where the specification of impurities non identified, it's over the limit of cohort of ICH. The general case 0 0.10, it's not identified, but some papers have some non specific classes. 0 0.2, 0.3, they have some synthetic comp components, so they can question that. But that's it. Uh, what we expect from this justification, we have to say that is pharmacopoeia in the IDH, we are going to check the alignment. In the other cases, no. And sometimes we ask why the EPA is not attending this spe specification, asking why. But as a rule, it was monographed uh, on, on the specific impurities, but the APIs that are in the ICH guideline, we request that limit of impurity to identify because we understand that this guideline is valid and we accept the monographies. What's more important is the qualification of the impurities, which are no identified. We have no idea what's that. Because in the, in the case of the monography, it can be adequate or not. So, so, uh, so usually we request the last one to explain the understand, to request, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't got that. The specific case do not have the synthetic stage. The molecule that uh, gets out of the fermentation doesn't have the link with the carbon. So that it's not accepted. We, they have to have multiple uh, synthetic stages. That's it, Nathan. I think she asked a specific case as uh, regarding the explanation, and that's it. So they didn't have any break of the connect connection. The start material has to have Synthesis stage, uh, according to everybody's understanding, in the ca in the case of SEM synthesis, CHK11 gives an understanding that the cell bank could be the start point, the first intermediary of chemical synthesis are not requirements to define that. So I think that's the explanation. I'm sorry, I can't hear. What's the main stage that generates more impurity, fermentation or massification? So if we leave the fermentation outside, we will we evaluate. We need to understand the profile because of the quality control. That's why we request the, the redefinition. Good afternoon, Ashley Labs. I would like to make a question about the optimized evaluation, RDC. 
750. There's no sound. I'm sorry, I can't hear. I would like to understand in the in definition of the start material if Anvisa is going to reevaluate the start material that was defined and accepted by IDQ or if automatically the agency accepting Anvisa also will accept the, the material that is that's describing IDQM. Nelio said that's nothing that's automatic. It's the regulatory trust. So we are going to take advantage what could be do. So it's area E, equivalent regulatory area. So relax because everything that we can uh, take advantage, but we have a rule that could be requested another uh, requests, but the agents want to use this tool in the best way. So only in specific cases, we are going to have these requirements. We need to understand the context regarding this evaluation, in what moments we have the ICH guidelines. So the idea is not to do a new technical evaluation, but we can have an exceptional case that we want to do this uh, redefinition request. So I understand it's not because of the flow the, of the RET 606, It's complicated to put in the regular line. We just have one. The flow of the RDC you cannot put in front of something. That's my point of view. We don't have a, a, a regular line or a 7th and 50 line to analyze by the flow to have a quicker analysis. So it's on this sense. Just one more thing. Recently, we received a request about redefinition of stored material that was request the redefinition. Clearly, the material was not well defined, but the stored material follow all the requirements and the guidelines of the CHQ on N, N minus three and four. It's possible to justify this item of request or when a visa requests the redefinition, the pharma, the industry, it's uh, obligated to redefine. I think that as exceptional case, when we have four stages of synthesis and the agency requests for you to rede redefine, as you mentioned. I, I don't know, but it's something out of the rules. You need to accomplish, if you are sure of that, and you are free to send any kind of documents that you think that's necessary to uh, leave out all the questions. We have tools. It's a surprise for me because usually when we request redefinition, it's something that's very clear. So we request uh, to justify for many re reasons, but it is something that's not correct. It's a question that I don't have the concrete case but I'm sure that the way you mentioned, there is the possibility of discussion, uh, or you, you said four stages. Are you sure that every start material are in less four? Because maybe you have one that's out of that, 
and the request was not well understood. And the, my answer is there always been the possibility to justify, but we need to be sure, read the references, or the guidelines. We have a guidelines about the stored material. We have some technical informations that are interesting and you can try it. But when you don't have a synthesis stage, zero possibility to be accept. Just one, very hard. Uh, just the, like a simple molecule, we try to do. We, we're not going to ask for a material on the oil chemical. Good afternoon, my Yuko from Chiu Lab. I don't know if it has to do with the question that you are going to talk with us, but it's a confirmation of understanding. I have an impurity, chinotoxic, with an X limit, 0.1%, for example. In the evaluation of this impurity in the chapter of genotoxic impurity, with N7 approach, depending on the discussion, if there's going to be a pressure from the agency, so the regulated sector constraints to this limit. When we evaluate to meet the request, we understand that the impurities are, are qualified, and we had one case of that. Described in official companions are qualified. I do not recommend that you constrain that's wrong the guidance is from the agents to qualify Anything else? What about my time? This theme, the handbook ICH M7 in the superficial, superficial or the profound. It's not the point for us to have many details, but some information needs to be on diff, otherwise going to be uh, something of request. I don't know if you can read it on the screen. What's the expe expectation from vision and an evaluation of uh, accomplish of multi genical impurity. So the company needs to send the evaluation. So all the impurities from the API that's not pharmacompendial, not solvents described on the guidelines need to be evaluated. The evaluation needs to involve the real impurities and the synthesis of the start material depending on the extension of the route we can leave that outside but that's the exception in general the evaluation are both of them so all this impurity need to have the description regarding the mold multigenical point. Impurity describes in uh, companions recognized by Anvisa are considered qualified when the evaluation will be conducted in the comput computational method which you have the prediction that complement itself. APIs that don't have evaluation for 
two met uh, methodologies. So the evaluation of mutagenical impurities when made by a comp computational method, we have two expert rule based or statistical based. So in summary, all the real impurities and potential ones of its synthesis route, except the pharmacopeico, need to have the evaluation to, with two techniques as described in the guidelines. The results of the evaluations uh, need to be sent on a spreadsheet because sometime, uh, since sometimes we cannot reproduce the evaluation. Sometimes we need to reproduce the evaluation of the company. That's why the ones that receive the demands regarding that maybe could read that, read that we got an important evaluation. So they have to identify the structure, identification, the chemical names, the evaluated impurity, the identification of the used softwares. So in summary, the expectation of Anvisa is that all the impurities would be evaluated and the outputs in the spreadsheet, all the softwares described and the results of the every each software need to be present. That's the basic expectation when the evaluation will be done by in silico method. Or it can it can have a bi bibliographic uh, mention, but it needs to be evaluated. But the company needs to classify the impurity of the, uh, the the classification according to the guidelines, and according to this classification, need to describe the classification. So it's the accomplish of the guideline ICHM7. Something that's important to remember that to impurities class one, its control needs to be from the specific limit, 50 per, for example, or toxicological study. Every time that the company have toxicological studies to be evaluated by Anvisa, those studies will not be evaluated by the quality areas. It's only be evaluated by the security and efficiency area manager. So this limit needs to be approved by the manager of security and efficiency. So that's some specification for experimental data. The derivation of TD50, sometimes we can found that on the literature carcinogenic potent database, so we can do it ourselves. But we've got an evaluation of experimental study is the management. So those impurities that have a prediction of mutagenicity has to respect this limit of 1.5 micrograms per day. It could be increased with the use of the API if it's a use of, no, that's not common, a molecule from the pharmacal, the approach less than lifetime could be used I'm going to try to summary that. We expect that the company makes an anal analysis of all the inputs of the API. When just one software, one methodology says, flags that it's mutagenic, this company uh, needs to classify that as class three. So with that, the conservative approach is to control it through a derivative limit that's 1.5 micrograms. So depends on the time of treatment. 
It's described on the uh, guideline ICHM7 that Anvisa adopts. So once more, we want you to accomplish this guidance and we want to receive a spreadsheet with the results, the evaluation, the name of the software, and the options of control of that those impurities, because otherwise uh, we are going to take out the request. It's not the focus to say how the analysis is going to be evaluated. But I want to say that there is a way of do this analysis and regard the silico approach we understand that all the evaluation need to be reviewed by experts but there is some, there are some cases that's very clear one one methodology based on rules expert based gives a 100% of trust this group is a warning structure the company need to control according to TTC only if there is a review of experts with toxicological information to undo this prediction. So if one of the two methodologies gives positive, impurities need to be treated as mutagenic. Uh, the company needs to review the result with an expert of the area and data or experimental study. What we want to receive on DIFA is that all the impure potential impurities need to be evaluated according to the guideline ICHM7. Silico and both rules software need to be validated with the principles of OECD. You cannot look and cloak it by itself. The software need to be validated. We have we got several ones in the market, but it we have free, uh, paid, based on web apps of any kinds. So all of their all of them are validated. The only detail that's important. This is going to Kajif. In Kajif, uh, we have an A dose that's being approved, dose and the duration of treatment for us to evaluate uh, for this evaluation less than lifetime. It could be approved or not. So that's important. It's important that the company mentions the information of the medicine uh, related to the dose and the way of tre treatment because if the company uh, adopted a strategy less than lifetime and said that this limit is not applied, it, they have a higher limit, it needs to use the time of treatment of the medicine approved by Anvisa. So because that comes from uh, outside, the dose and the uh, come from abroad, the doses and the time of treatment needs to be the same one that we got here. So we need that says what we need to consider. It's just to clarify because that's not unusual. We got some definitions of limits that are based in the LDL approach, less than lifetime. And when we look at that, it's not described on our li lift what the company is So that's li the limit of 1.5. So to make that flexible, we need to adapt our, our time of treatment. And not always uh, that comes on DIFA. Another topic that's very common on our request, it's like a standard one when we have an impurity that is mutagenical or has a prediction of that and the company doesn't want to put that this control on a routine if you have a potential company a prediction of that 
And the owner of the diff uh, says that's not going to put the control on the specification. It's possible. It's uh, option four of the ICH M7 guidance. But not the owner of the diff can evaluate that. This approach needs to be very serious because from the synthesis processes, why we request the description of the process because the company can say that uh, impurity that's mutagenic is not going to be on the API specification. So they study and give scores of elimination described in a paper. And then and from this evaluation of Fulgon, it can say that this impurity is only potential, not real, and it's not going to be controlled. This is possible. I'm going. I'm speaking very quickly. But the uh, option four of the guideline says that when we have the knowledge of the process, we can ensure that it's not going to be on API. It's possible if the company uh, prove in a technical way with some quantitative and some quantitative tools to prove that this impurity is only potential and not real. The most important of this part that I mentioned, I'm going to skip that. But the most important of this, of this part is to say that our expectations are impurities need to be evaluated and controlled according to the guideline. The approach less than lifetime is accept. We do not understand that the analysis of three consecutive lots is uh, enough. That's something that happens all the time. The company, the owner of the DIFA, have an impurity that's mutagenic and make uh, three lots, consecutive three, three lots, and it's not possible. That's not accept at a moment. We can accept the company sends and these three lots analysis that under 30% of the limit, derivative limits of ITC. And then we can approve the inclusion of the periodical control, but it's not the exemption. There are some cases where we can mix the approach by the option four and the approach of low, low, loads analysis. But there are specific cases that it needs to be described what's happening with this impurity. So just clarify the three batches. It's not accept at this moment. That's the periodical control in the API specification. We can do an, a skip test, but not um, uh, we have to describe stage by stage. And then you can conclude that this impurity can have the control exempt. I don't know if you are familiar with this uh, quantitative approach to show the purge of impurity. It's going to be in our Q&A session some data use, some use that, and sometimes not present in the correct way. So what I just mentioned, we have some questions. I <laughs> This is not enough. The analysis of three batches is not enough for to exempt the control of impurities in potential mutagenic impurities. Are you awake? Is everything all right? Can I can I continue? Excellent. Let's go. Let's move on. 
when to register the auditing of the impurity. I'm going to do a disclaimer to you, uh, but it's, it's necessary. Just for you to understand that when you have the organic impurity of, of synthesis above the qualification of, of the RDC uh, qualification, uh, I mean the College Board's Resolution 359, when there is uh, experimental studies this topic is in the management of, of safety and they do the analysis the guy the guide the ICH guide Q3 and the data of mutagenic uh, experimentation test has to, we need to have the mutagenic activity if there is a experimental test quite this does not analyze only the management of experimental tests We'll analyze that. This is how it should be. You should not do the, the request of the impurity uh, of the companion recognized by Anvisa. This is just what I mentioned to you. The auditing should be registered when toxicological security date are requested. This is the auditing. The motivation is to assist the cases of the impurities to the assessment of impurities, we recommend the uh, topic code and the holder of Kadifa. There's another session now. I believe you want to take a break. I don't know what how, what 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 we are like time wise. Extra time. That's good. All right, just let's do it quickly. This one is important. These were questions that you asked. How the pharmachemical companies need to proceed when they are in queue to be assessed by Anvisa? Was any change implemented? In case the analysis was not started, the company can um, have the change done. If there is a change in the DIFA, even you can have an audit, we will analyze it in the moment of the assessment. But if the analysis has started, well then, it's not possible. RDC 359, the batch analysis, can we include the, the results of pilot scale for example, can I have the analysis of pilot scale and then decision of the process uh, of quantity of materials in industrial scales? The answer is yes. Yes, you can. You should present the analysis of uh, three, three batches, at least three batches, with the process described and the specification proposed by DIFA. The company needs to present the results, test results, with, with the described processes, but the scale can have the pilot scale results uh, at least uh, as soon as if it is in the same process you need to have two results in industrial scale and commercial scale in your CADIF request and none of them can be the pilot scale now the analysis of the external the sober state. But the CADIFA request associated was given as uh, CADIFA as sober state. When the, manuf the manufacturer of the medication wants to register, this movement will be altered to, to as in analysis? The answer is no. The petition will have the situation changed to in analysis when there is a technical sub uh, bet uh, uh, under technical analysis. When, if it is effective, the CADIFA request is connected to the process, it will be distributed to analysis or waiting for analysis. So, in, uh, in summary, the situation will be changed to under analysis when it is actually under analysis. I think it was clear, right? It is mandatory to have the process flow of the open part of the DIFA? The answer is no. The open part 
should contain at least the synthesis route diagram in a simplified way in the process of manufacturing from the starting material. So the, the company doesn't have the obligation to send all of the materials according to this resolution. To section S32, Avisa has considered the most uh, necessary demonstration of uh, proving the capacity of the method of detection of impurities, considered uh, impurities coming from intermediates, intermediaries by degradation. I don't think I really understood this question, but well, when I read it, I answered, it depends. In some specific cases, it can be necessary to demonstrate that a certain impurity coming from an, an intermediary or a degradation product that does not have a, no, a known structure, structure that is controlled in the retention time, for example, it is absent at IFA. I mean, uh, absent at the API. So in, the, in those cases, you have to demonstrate the capacity of detection to the doctor, uh, to the method, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. Well, as far as I understood, it depends. As a general rule, in, uh, when you talk about intermediary product, we don't do this analysis, this very detailed analysis. Some clients do not accept the tests in silica to come to prove the levels of impurities, and they uh, re demand the analysis of three batches to, to prove the limits of impurity. This generates uh, discredit of the tests themselves. So would uh, Anvisa accept the as adequate the um, presentation of the tests in silica. I think you were talking about the analysis of the purging. So we accept it, but this, the systems, they have to be followed up with discussions of the conclusions of the results obtained. The um, in silica uh, tests and systems have to be understood as an auxiliary tool. So we are not against the, the tool in, in silica, but these tools, they are just uh, support to conclude something about, about the test. So the company ha needs to have a review of what is being said. So we don't, we're not against the test with silica. We would like to confirm the exemption of Kadifa in terms of uh, when in cases of inclusion of new concentration in case the API is the same that was already registered. This question was longer, but I just made it short just to uh, focus on the center of the question. I would say that yes, it is confirmed. Petitions of new uh, concentration of uh, an API that was approved and is already registered does not need to present Kadifa as it is um, explained in the R, uh, RDC 359 2020. So it is clear that it is exempt in the cases of th that I mentioned, the request of inclusion of new concentration of API. So you don't need to request Kadifa for that case. We would like to understand if it, it will be possible the registry protocol of the manufacturer of medication and a later request of a different CBPF if they are sent in the deadline, in specific deadlines, which is 10 days. The answer is no. According to the, the normatives in force and the CADIFA in the number of registration, it is a request in the moment of the submission and should not be postponed it has to be fulfilled in a moment uh, within the auditing um, deadline. So the company needs to request the, the register of the medication with this information already. In the case of change of DIFA, with the CADIFA issued, uh, considering the annual notification and the section of DIFA, how can a manufacturer of the finished product will send this information to Anvisa? Just to summarize it, the change related to DIFA with CADIFA has to have to be registered in the terms of the RDC 359. When the change of DIFA does not imply a change in CADIFA, the issuer should not register the change. 
so it was not mentioned so i'm saying this now but the changes that review a different will require a protocol of for registering the the medication according to the norm so in general as a general rule when there are changes in the differ with kadifa the register holder of medication has to assess if there was a revision of kadifa for the corresponding uh, register as it is uh provided for in the rdc 361 so you can imagine people you can interrupt me anytime you want okay Register protocol. Register protocol by the company that owns the that uh, holds the medication and CBPF. In the case of post registration of inclusion, in the cases of the API that is so, uh, superstated by Anvisa, but during the analysis of Cardifa request, the manufacturer updates the the differ uh, documentation changing the ifs uh, changing the api so how can be done the finished medication the question here is when kadifa was approved and there was a change of information on inclusion of tests how is it treated in the gq med uh, requests it will be uh, will it be requested the uh, documentation of the finished medication in both uh, requests of Cardifa will be done in the sequence. The, question, the answer is, when the manufacturer of the medication has the knowledge of the changes of, of DIFA and changes the methods and specifications, the most efficient approach is to have an auditing of the specific update of the registry after the analysis of the procedures. And it, it has to be done by the medication manufacturer and you have to inform this change to Anvisa, this, this will allow the agency to, to have a process of with the technician for the analysis of the changes. It f facilitates the follow-up and understands th that all the, it, all the changes were considered in the process. The agency will decide a necessary mechanism to update the documentation of the registration of the medication. In all cases, this me mechanism will cause a slowness in the process. Was that clear to you? If you have questions, we can ask GQ Med. I'm. I have the back. Uh, I'm. I turned my back to you. I'm sorry. You have a question, right? Good afternoon. My question is regarding. The previous question, the second last question, when you talked about the changes that the manufacturer registers, and my question is, in this, in the following case, I'm going to give you an example. The manufacturer of API registers a change of annual notification for an event, but it had an impact at Kadifa. So would it generate a revision of Kadifa? For example, an exclusion of tests of non a uh, significant test. So I understand it will generate a revision of Kadifa to exclude this test. But this change registered by him is in the annual notification. Will you carry out evaluation in this case? Because it is a notification change in Kadifa. OK, let me see if I understood. You're talking about the document that you, as a pharmaceutical uh, company, will send to a visa. No, I, I didn't reach this point of the question. The manufacturer has a change in the the differ holder they, they made a change and it is understood as an annual notification change so he will send all the uh proving uh, documentation of the change and it will um have a review in, in kadifa so all this annual modification re, uh, report they are by the rdc uh, 359 considered minor so we we'll have to issue a revised kadifa Yes, because you reviewed the Kadifa. So it is a document that was, re if you re revise any change in the present Kadifa, or if it was a, a major change, as you're, you're describing, there was a change in the document itself. So if there was a change, we need to assess that. And the Kadifa will, will be signed by the main uh, 
the general manager. Now the question is about is concerning the medication manufacturer. If because it's an annual uh, change by the cadifa holder, it, it can change a little longer to send the documentation documents to Anvisa within 12 months. But they will implement this change and they will notify this change to the medication holder. The guidance is we as medication holder, is it for us to wait for the reviewed Kadifa to, to make this uh, modification to 73? Or because I have the knowledge of this change, I can register it to make this situation regular in the 73. And when the 73 requests the revised Kadifa, I just send the technical justification for the document because the document was not issued at Anvisa. Let me clear out. This question is directed to the area of medication registration. I'll try to answer it, but please, uh, my colleagues, help me. We send a justification. Yes, for us. Interpretation service apologizes. People are speaking off the microphone. The second option that she mentioned to send a revised, instead of sending the revised Kadifa, to send a justification. This change in the IN73 can take a while to be registered. So the company will take a little while to do it. So we need to understand this coupling, how, uh, how this coupling will, done, will be done. So I recommend uh, for you to make a justification in the revised Kadifa because it can take longer. I want to take the chance to ask another question. I think it will be more um, addressed to GQ Med because it's not about um, the. Uh, I'd like to understand a little better how the communication between Koifa and GQ Med is, is done when we show the information regarding not a uh, legal entity number or the address of the manufacturer, thinking of the flow of Kadifa. Let me give you an example to make it easier to understand. For a, for a uh, API that has a Kadifa and the manufacturer needs to have um, an update in the legal entity number. It is a completely administrative uh, change. And if you look at the IN73, you have this change for the ones that do not have Kadifa. But when I go to the 73 framework for APIs that have Kadifa, I, I, I would have these changes from Difa to Kadifa. So this change today, if you merely look at the prerequisites in, in the administrative changes, that would be considered a minor change and it could be done. But we know that for changes that are registered uh, through MP is not the most efficient regulatory um, means for the registration uh, update. And for us, uh, as a company that holds the medication, the um, legal entity number of, of the company can impact in other areas. If it's not clear in the dossier of the medication for all the areas to consult, we may have some rejections in the import process and other, and other things. So how is this communication of these registration data in this new Kadifa flow? I think, I hope I was clear in my question. No more. <laughs> I hope I, my answer will be clear too. Well, if I'm not mistaken, when there is an update of Kadifa, this will be in the registration of the medication. So I understand that people, my name is Saul, I'm the CPMEC coordinator, and basically we take care of the registration of medication and we do some small complexity requests. We provide support to GQ Med, our biggest client, Coifa. We've had some uh, combats, and I, I'm, I keep interfering, interfering in their job. The change in the legal entity number were, uh, was a 
request created to update the registration of the medication. This was all before Kadif uh, and before Coins. When Coins decided to handle the registration of the manufacturers uh, for APIs, when it is when the information is changed at Coins, it is changed in the medication number. But in any case, because it is a request that is already in the in the, in the IN seventy three, you need to protocol it. So in the beginning, we wouldn't uh, do that because the the registration was correct. Yes, it is correct, but we have to do that. We have to understand that the legal entity number was changed. At Kadifa, we still have the so uh, the legal entity name included. If Kadifa communicates with Coinfa and this legal entity name was is changed, automatically Kadifa is updated. But there is a problem here concerning systems. When I need to check the report of all medication that use a certain manufacturer of API, if I don't have this API manufacturer uh, registered by code B of Coinfo, I cannot check the Kadifas. So unfortunately, until we can have the system reports to generate BI that will see API and Kadifa, the B code of Coins and Kadifa, you will have to do this protocol because we update, it acti uh, update B code actively and Kadifa will be automatically updated. So if I already have a Kadifa issued today, do I have to do this protocol? Yes. What is the change uh, in the 73 to do the protocol? My administrative change, it was the change of Difa to Kadifa, right? So I would do the change of Difa without Kadifa with the immediate implementation. Is that right? It is a change of the legal entity name. It is an administrative uh, change of Difa without Kadifa. So when I go to the framework with Kadifa, I don't have an administrative change. I have the three changes of Difa with Kadifa. In our case, in this case, even if it's just a legal entity name change, I would I would go to 1B, which is the immediate implementation. So I have the technical documents, assessment documents. I can justify because it is just a uh, change in the registration. I have a final question, taking advantage that you're here. Um, it's a third example. I have, let's say I have a change. The fabricator, the manufacturer of the uh, API in the flow without the Kajipa, they did a change in their process. <clears throat> yeah, but that one doesn't have a specific protocol. That's what they're saying. It's in J, J, yes. Because they have a specific protocol. And then GQNet can see this and make a change in the registry. We have a case like that. That's why I ask. No, but that was good because I have this case and there are people speaking out the mic. That's why not making much sense. Interpretation apologizes for that. And once again, there are people speaking off of the microphone. Interpretation apologizes. Well, it's, it's the following. Uh, we have a very limited time right now, so we need to have the next presentation. And, uh, and I just wanted to say goodbye and thank you all. And I've received a bunch of, uh, you only have 10 minutes left, you only have five minutes left, so on and so forth. And so you can talk about GQ Med amongst yourselves. And I hope, I hope everything went well. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Aitan Hosh, for your presentation. Are you going to finish your question or are you okay? If you're going to answer, i just like to you to answer it through the microphone because it could be a general question. And now, uh, after that, we'll invite Henan Goiz, who will be talking about administrative aspects and challenges. So let's say we're doing a change in a registry from Kadifa to uh, without a Kadifa. It's a change that requires confidential documentation by the API manufacturer. So let's say the manufacturer wants to implement this change. We also want to implement this change. I understand that I need to fulfill the checklist with all of the documents for me to implement this. Is the guidance that I should wait until the GMP and until I do a third party addition so that they add this uh, documentation or would I be able to in, in a legal manner change this change so that the manufacturer can implement this and we should implement this and only what well, because I want to stand there we can only do this addition to a third party after we have an expedient from DMP. We don't have that issue with the HMP in this case. So what's the HMP logic? There's smaller changes so that were already implemented during that year. So you already have that documentation uh, at hand so that you're able to do this change. In your case, you don't have that documentation. So we would have to really look at that specific case to see if the company could implement that change or reclassify it because the company is not the holder of all the documentation in that case. So how do you actually do this? Because they have confidentiality issues. I see this as a fragility, really, to be able to implement this and to be able to be an HMP. I have, let's say we have a change in the in inclusion of a starting material. It's explicit both in 359 as a small change and in 73 as an HMP change. So I think that the question is not really about if it's a small change or not, but rather of how I'm going to give the agency to this documentation if I need an expedient num expediency number, I'm only gonna have that later when I protocol the HMP. There are people speaking off the microphone. How do I send this documentation? It's for a flow that is is not in Kadifa yet. It's an a, a API that's not in the Kadifa flow yet. We also went through that situation. So we can talk about that later and in, in another moment with GQ Med. Yes, we can discuss the, the alternatives such as you protocoling HMP and then you put an addition by a third party inside the DMP. That's a possibility. Yeah, we thought about something like that. But the issue that we is that we wanted to implement this change. We wanted to receive the API in these new conditions even without me having closed all the documentation because we shouldn't have that specific documentation. But I think that we can talk about that later. Yes, we can ensure that because it's a very specific case, the one that you mentioned. And that's what I would suggest. Maybe we can have the third party edition later. Just... Okay, we'll be speaking internally. That's the following. When you have the protocol in the COEFA, it's the same in the net system. So I'm going to be talking with Saul for the HMP. Oh, Saul is here. Okay. But we'll align that with GQMed, of course. And no, I don't really know a lot about HMP. We inverted the program, so he started before me because it was a more important part, the more technical part. 
that we rarely talk about. The administrative part is a little bit more well known, so I'm going to try and go a little bit faster. Is it okay for us to go until five? I think most of you are sleeping in Brasilia, right? So. So I'm going to talk about analysis management, that issue that we talked about, external uh, management. I'm going to go quickly because we already discussed this. So Kadifa, when it comes in, it comes in as an external. When do I change this situation? When we have a notification of the Kadifa process at GQMED. So we link these processes, let's say, and we turn it to uh, distributed by responsible party. And then when we when it's uh, waiting for analysis, then we change it to awaiting analysis, and then it becomes a Kadifa after the analysis. This is already something that we already discussed. Where's the receiver of the of the clicker signal? It's over there. Oh, I thought it was okay. I'll, let me see up here. All right, I already mentioned this. It's all repeated. Oh, that's great, because we don't have a lot of time. Have we already talked about this question? OK, Marina, please read the question. We're going to have the collaboration of, of Marina. She's going to be reading the questions. She told me to stand up. Come to the pulpit, please. Oh, my god. Hello, good afternoon. Considering that we have the possibility of including API manufacturers through the 1D uh, decision through exclusion, as long as we have the requisites for non-impact in the impurity profile of the API and the medication, the link uh, requisition of the Kadifa should be done in the post-registration of the Kadifa. Who asked this question? OK. so. The inclusion of the location of manufacturer, you don't need the 1722. If you're going to include a DIFA that has a Kadifa, then yes. If you're only including the location of, of manufacturer the, in your DIFA that's already approved, then you don't need to change. The, the Kadifa is already approved. So we need to we need to, 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 to separate the place the location of manufacturer with the Kadifa and Kadifa. This is protocol 1722. If you include a location, then if they don't have Kadifa, then they will continue without Kadifa. If they do have a Kadifa, then we'll be included into that. This is 1722. This is just for changes in 1A and 1E. Let's continue. So I'm going to try and exemplify the change in concept that we have. Let us see a medication that has a dossier that's been approved, DIFA-1. We have three different locations of manufacture. One fabric uh, manufactures uh, intermediary-1, intermediary-2, and the other one uh, manufactures API-1. I'm going to include a new location of manufacture for intermediary-2 in an approved dossier. So I'm going to do the 1D change that the colleague mentioned. So I don't need to make a protocol for 1722 because we're not going to have a DIFA emission we're, uh, issuance. We're actually going to have this is a new uh, DIFA. However, if we have a new uh, a, a new uh, manufacturer of an API, then also it's the same. However, if we're including a new dossier, then we're going to have to do a new dossier, dossier, and then we're going to have a new 1722, and then I'm going to issue a uh, Kadifa because every new dossier is going to create a Kadifa. I'm going to do it just like I did. Was that clear? I hope that was clear. It's hard to keep, it's hard to keep your attention now that after a certain time in the afternoon. So and this is just to show you this change in the model. So before we were thinking, talking about 359 as a place of manufacture, now we're talking about the DIFA holder, the inclusion of the DIFA. So we are, I already talked about this. Do you have a question? Go to the pulpit. So let's talk a little bit about the notification in the DIFA process. When does it need to be petitioned? When the DIFA is already issued, then I don't need to the Kadifa is already uh, issued. When 
after the registration of the medication, then we don't need a valid Kadifa for, to be uh, uh, approved. Why am I going to do a, a topic protocol 1722? Well, if you have the post registration of RDC 215, then you don't need a Kadifa, so you don't need to do the topic uh, protocol 1722. Cloning, you don't need that as well. And this is something that's in our uh, question and answer on RDC 359. I'm going to go very quickly through this. The 365 days, prioritize 180 days. Oh, no, prioritize 120 days. Post registration 180, prioritize 60. Kodifa is going to be following this uh, timeline. Kodifa only goes into analysis of the on the external. Uh, right after I exchange this, then this goes to the responsible area. Then I'm going to do the timeline of who indicated that. So it was a medication registration. I'm going to put the date of the uh, registration. I'm going to put in 365 days for me to do my queue. So actually, my queue is how much do I need to fulfill this? So if we have a, a shorter timeline, then they're a little bit closer. I'm going to try to give you an example here. Is it about this? The question, is it about that? It's about the Kadifa queue or something like that? Okay, let me just get, the, there's a cool slide here that I made. And then I think you might understand. Have we already talked about this, Andersa? Marina? Okay. I'm so, I'm gonna be a little more joyous. Yeah, I'm sounding bad. For conditional approvals, the emission of Kadifa is necessary. The issuance of Kadifa is necessary. However, we're verifying and monitoring that the issuance of Kadifa is taking longer than what is uh, uh, assumed for a petition. In this way, should it be? No, this is already in the questions and answers for RDC 73. They already updated this. Marina, could you continue, please? This is the answer for the question that came. It's in, it's question 366 on question answer RDC 734, conditional approach under RDC. Then we'll, if they have the issuance of Kadifa on that guidelines, establish that according to Article 4 and also on the, the first item as is described, RDC 73 for changes in. Uh, of type 1A and 1F establishes clearly that they are need DFAs and Kadifas that are valid. So the CBPF and the Kadifa go against what's going on in the first item of the fourth article. So GQ Med still has another more personalized answer beyond what's in question and answers. Kadifa is for issuances that have conditional foreseen in RDC 319. In the case that Kadifa is of technical documentation foreseen in the list of instruction documentations in that topic code. That means that if Kadifa is demanded for instruction of a given petition, then its non presentation makes the petition precarious and therefore it, they cannot use the conditional approval mechanisms as disciplined in that article for first item and therefore Kadifa is necessary for uh, conditional petitions and for post registration in the case that they are needed in the instruction of the petition. If they are not demanded for that specific petition, then they won't delay the approval of that petition. And that was a very long answer. Let's continue. Okay, you can ask your question. Well, actually, it's a little bit more of what you were saying before in the timeline for analysis. Actually, I just wanted to understand what the issue of the distribution of the processes is like. Why am I asking this question? Well, we have two different situations. I from Physioscopy and Tasia. I have a situation of one registration that was prioritized. The analysis of that registration was already concluded, but the Kadifa is still distributed to area. So the Kadifa still wasn't analyzed, but the registration was already evaluated a while now, and it was prioritized. And 
we also have situation of Kadifas that were accepted way before the registration was accepted. We have a few processes in which the Kadifa was already uh, was already accepted when the registration wasn't. So I just wanted to understand how this actually works because if the registration was prioritized, technically we understood that the Kadifa would also be prioritized to actually be accepted. Yeah, that's the way it should happen. Okay, I'm already aware of that. We had a bit of a problem. We uh, got delayed in the priority in advance in the regular one. We're talking to GQMED because we need to follow their instructions. Ronaldo, do you want to say something? So what have we been doing together with Hina? Distribution, as you know, is by trimester. So in my distribution, I give that to Hina. So they do theirs based on ours. And as you know, we implemented that in the last distribution. So we hope that very soon all of these unalignment problems are solved. We're going to be doing our distribution of productivity, and that goes to Hena, and then Hena follows, produces his own. They have another uh, queue, and they've been talking to us lately to try and do a meeting so that we can discuss the mechanisms for prioritization. What's the order they should follow? So very soon we should have an alignment in this sense. So we need to, to align that. And then you can see that we're actually ahead, but we were following another process really. Still about that, right? Are my questions related to conditional? We went through transition both as the, the, the regulated sector and through you, and we received some guidance that were supposed that conditional would be applicable for API manufacturer, and some companies received the publication of the condition of while the Kadifa still wasn't issued and now in the question and answers we have a new guidance so our question is how do we do this from now on okay so in these cases in which the company received the conditional approach without Kadifa having been approved as you were saying that I was thinking about I was thinking about that as thinking okay that was a mistake now we're doing it right okay so what went through my mind was, uh oh, we made a mistake. So that shouldn't have been approved. So these sort of 1A petitions, the inclusion of a new API without a Kadifa. Oh, I wanted to have a conditional approach. How could I have an approach or how can I have an approval if the soul of it isn't approved? So that would be a very precarious uh, approval. So we see all of those changes as a precarious document. So while the Kadifa inside it, because the information is inside it without approval, then there's no value there, is there? So at the moment when it's approved, then we'll do that. This is my COIFA. I was always analyzing the Kadifas. Was that in January? No, that was recent, right? Oh, okay. They were, they were in protocol starting in January. But if you want to give us a list, then we can solve that, I'm sure. Just send us a list. I think I need it. I didn't want to say that, but uh, you can submit the
petition to 219 qualifies the petition to be approved conditionally. We need it to uh, see where these petitions are. Sometimes it's, it, you think it's not approved, but it is. So we never know when the approval is going to occur. And if I have the attach on that, we cannot flag the petition. So even when we got that, we are going to still editing that. It could be approved conditionally. That's why it needs the addition, the attachment. I'm Vanessa from Glaxo. Uh, regarding the conditional to make the deadlines be uh, of, to happen. So that's being done, the petition. A different analysis and the traditional approval because sometimes they're uh, penalized because the it's not viable to accomplish regarding the necessity. Let me explain something. Can you go back to other slide? We need to clarify an initial which is the 290 the 19 do not, does not apply to this case. So to join that, they, they are not penalized. On the uh, Article 4, they would be instructed with all the documents. So one of that is the Kajif. Why in this case they are obligated to make the attachment? Because at any moment, CAGIF could uh, be approved, and then we can make the conditional approval even after six months. Not necessarily it's going to go to the ordinary analysis. Maybe nine months, it could be approved with the additional the attachment. That's why the attachment needs to be there. It's going to have the right to be approved at the moment that all the documentation are instructed. So I still got my question in the sense that when it's not prioritized, how it's analyzed, how it's uh, how you start the anal how the COIFA start the analysis. That's the point where all the sector need to see and what they need to do to improve the, the quickness on the analysis. If it's like, if it's only how to do because otherwise Renan will die because he needs to prioritize. Sometimes in, in the, his distribution, it's uh, not, Good, the, the framework. If well, it, this question was directed to people with the power of decision in the country and say, why the area X that's so, so fundamental does not have the necessary, the structure that's required. He not prove everything because his team is wonderful. I'm going to explain how I work, how I dance the song. Are you going to talk ab anything about reliance? So we got the registration line. I put some data, dates there so we can base. So we have three periods of registration, January, uh, February, March. We have three post registration. And we have the Cadicious list. Let's see the first register. The guy protocol. What is what is the Cadif? January of twenty twenty four. 
next one protocol the same date and so indicate the same kadifa so it's a short deadline so on, on my line it, we have a long deadline uh, gets out and then i take the longer one the second register indicates this other one and give the uh, deadline of analysis and then we have the other one which shorter and it's behind of the middle one the next one it's blue it's prioritized 11721 who it indicates the kadifa from the top because it's the deadline of prioritized registration it's equal so we have two for we have the uh, that gave the same deadline. That's how we dance to see the date of every Kadifa that I have, so I can build the process. I can see the deadline of the main one, and then I give the deadline, and then I I build my line because Kadifa is each one each one is one so it depends on the deadline did you understand so we have the line of kajifa process we have uh, the two one so you can follow you because we update this attachment start according to the kajifa line so when it starts, that are the states that I work with. Andresa, can uh, did you talk about that? Naif. Okay. So let's keep going. So basically what I explained. So the analysis following, uh, you can consider that we have Kajifa handbook. So you can uh, see that uh, we have English and Portuguese. So entering the website, that's the fields that you need to fill in. So we can see your process stay. So you can follow up on this website. The administrative documents, the dossier of uh, APIs. What's the administrative document? It's on the Article 9, the petitioning document. In the practical, in practice, it's a obligate, it's a mandatory item. We cannot send other documents than this one. So we got declarations, the attachments, attach, attachment one, the FP, form got several pages just one detail on the last page we have this item free which is very important to us to uh, take the analysis from other medicine so you you can put on that coif analyzed so we can uh, take that again if it was approved in another country If it was a proven WHO, you can mention. And then uh, we have the uh, attachment protocols. So attachment one is the authorization letter from the registration form. 
it's to confirm the register that we made in the company coming from the dossier. And we ask that it would be in the initial uh, requirement. So uh, it's only at the first, I'm sorry, I lost it. Okay, uh, attach, attachment to the declaration of the manufacturer comprom uh, compromising to inform the owner of GIFA of any uh, change when uh, the, we have the same company. When our different uh, companies, we got this declaration. So it's a uh, uh, form from the manufacturers, the owner of the GIFA. If it's the same company, you don't, you don't need to fulfill. Uh, attachment three, four, five, and six. The, uh, the, the declaration of uh, manufacturing according to the dossier and uh, the agreements of rules of BPF. Uh, attachment for declaration of this position to be ins inspectioned. Uh, uh, attachment five about the uh, materials from human origin. This uh, attachment seven, it's a commitment of the owner of DIF that needs to be signed. So he just uh, certified that he read all the documents and it's going to inform all the clients of any change and if they got a review a suspension or canceling of DIF, DIFA they are going to uh, inform the pharmaceutical and then he accepts a visa to share information the ones that sign is the owner of the GIFA attachment 8 your our comparative spreadsheet so it's at the submission of the change when you go to the similar different what's similar what's different because we go what's different to analyze and when we got a change so little bits of the organization of the Model three, it's on the norm. It says that need to uh, follow the guide CPD according the annex uh, attachment three. Uh, to evaluate the uh, API quality. So, where it's mentioned what's restrict, what's open. We have both columns here and the title here explaining. So basically the manufacturing section, which is divided, maybe uh, impurity can occur. So it's a place to a specification to. It's a mandatory item. So it's the tailoring of the chief. Maybe I can have a different answer. This is a question that talks about changes. Marina is going to read. According to Article 68 of the Norm 359, the number and the date of DIFA needs to have the owner of the DIFA data. 
and the place of manufacturing, the description of the package, a conditioning and the ex expiration. So we can consider that any change on their quality or administrative impl implicates on the need of a new request of CAGIF or it will be just reviewed in case of necessity of a new request it will uh, be on a priority line. You can protocol a change. Kadifa has a circle of life. You don't need to uh, register a new one. So any change, we can review it. Seven five zero. all those questions the association sent to us uh, previously so we can uh, give the answers on this presentation thank you to co for collaborating we verified that some manufacturers that protocol this uh, request of kajif are receiving a uh, document from the agency so what is the optimized document to follow with this procedure the manufacturer have are having a difficulty to uh, make a report regarding the object of the request has essential characteristics that are approved by AREE and request to the manufacturer a uh, better clarification. So uh, we'd like to know the prediction of the agency to publish a model of the report. So the attachment of this uh, 7500 is this report it's an evaluation how to apply the reliance we don't have a model so basically we can create when we have time in two years huh? but what i suggest uh, that you need to comprove that they are equal products you have to say that the time that's on uh, WHO, the level of API is the same here. Maybe we are going to have difference. So I suggest that you make this discussion based on uh, attachment two. And when it's different, we request to fulfill with the attach attachment eight. If uh, you put that on the comparative spreadsheet. so we can uh, make that uh, in a more quicker way. Currently, the COIF is uh, issuing documents about the optimized procedure and use the analysis conducted by AR EE according to the norm for uh, AFIs that uh, have CAGIF a request. That's why we got, I have some questions. Some cases, the request of CAGIF of a specific item had the approval from CAGIF, and this information was reported in the petition uh, form. Approved and approved in another agencies. So I have this following questions. Why it's not using the approval uh, of OS 58? So we are going to take the one that's under OS 58. What happens that we demand the fulfillment of all the uh, normatives? We have to request to the owner of the DFA or you can articulate that with them. So it's uh, uh, one more adm administrative work. Or you can compare the dossier. It's a huge work. So we go through the norm uh, 750, and the ones that submit that is easier. Some cases, the emission of different I understand that's a cooperative document. Example, attachment eight would be collaborative to uh, don't leave any doubt. And different from the version used on OS 58. 
So we can do that in a cooperative analysis. The document com comes without a deadline to re respond. It's possible to include this possibility because we have a case where we were working on the document according to the uh, guidelines, but we have an internal delay because of the demand. So we received a demand from COIFA and this API was being approved by the OS58. Initially, we screened so we had a delay, but we are screening the Pacific. So we will, will not have this problem again. So we are going to be to make the ordinary analysis. We uh, didn't want to uh, delay this analysis, though, so that was a mistake. CBPF from API. What's the in the new landmark RDC 359? We talked about the attachment three that accomplished the rules of BPF. Attachment four declaration that need to be special. So it's going to have to have replace. Article 59. The owner of GIFA needs to inform the requester or the owner of all the changes that uh, need to be approved. It's the attachment two. Even when requested by the good practice of manufacturing or agreements of qualities. There's not only the change that are need to uh, protocol on the agents, any change needs to be informed. It will be in the norms of good practices. So uh, every Oh, it was about reliance. I'm sorry. It's more just to confirm the understanding. Also, we had the uh, partner manufacturers that received the recommendation 750. And concerning the report, you do, you commented how it should be prescribed, and these questions are coming to us. But uh, it is said that it can be public. It is a topic that becomes a difficulty to the manufacturer. Will you need this report? I believe it is something more related to medication. This uh, public opinion, but we don't have anything of that public. It was a norm applied to both. And then I spoke to Nelly about it. So I said it was not mandatory. If the if the company wants it to be public, then they need to declare it. But I don't have any intention to, to publish to publish anything. We're not even publishing the approved califas. Imagine the report. But I understand it isn't a norm, and we, they end up having this um, misunderstanding. But there was an RCP. It's an IN that will be published, it will be included there. I'm sorry about the confusion. That's me again. The first time I didn't introduce myself, my name is Mariana. My question is regarding CBPF. Is there any case of a change that the manufacturer did in the uh, manufacturing uh, process that requires a new CBPF? Or will this, flux, uh, will be, this flow be separated? For example, the CBPF is valid in the two years of CBPF, and then it will be in the flow of the lifespan of CBPS, regardless of changes in the route of synthesis. I can answer that, but I'm going to ask Michelle to do it. CBPF is a dynamic document, right? So there's a renewal, and then they have the control of the changes that have to be assessed, right? Please, Michelle. Exactly. Yes, exactly. In practice, it does not require the change of CBPF that is in, uh, in force because the certification of good manufacturing practices, it will not impact in the certification itself. But in the next analysis, probably. I can think of a new manufacturing uh, place. So the norm is to have this um, good manufacturing uh, Practices has to is necessary. 
and again about reliance we are we have this uh, norm temporary norm 790 and it, it allows the, the reliance for the OMS and uh, Kadifa. but in the analysis of reliance and considering for new uh, ifs uh, I mean for new APIs by the DKM because it was not included the uh, API was not included in the European uh, norm the submission of the uh, uh, CEP. I would like to make a proposal in the revision of the official norm of reliance to be considered the possibility to use approval of other agencies, the FDA and others, the same way that it is submitted for the registration of medication of the same modules that we today submit for the issuing of CADIFA. As long as the companies can prove that the same modules were reviewed and approved by the agencies. I don't know if it is being considered. Just I'd like to point out this. Yes, it was considered in this scope of uh, COIF and, and BPN. There are some things that are not covered in the new DIFAS. It There will not be a certificate for RECAM. So we, we want to see, to check what authority we will start talking about that there are years of cooperation with uh, WHO and FDA but the norms they use um, is, are different it's not very simple that we need to have discussions among agencies we're not talking about acceptance but it is about um, a quicker analysis um, according to the analysis of the authorities the authorities that we have uh, closeness in terms of norms and work we're going to consider other agencies and well it is going to be covered and if you want to suggest a, an agency that you usually work as far as I know none of them has issued a report analysis for API or a separate submission a separate analysis or or um, a letter of adequacy. So we need to think of this uh, th this use. It will facilitate the work. So we need to start the talk with FDA, Health Canada, to speak to them to understand how they work. I don't know what how they work. I know what, what is public for us, but I don't know the detail. But we want to have this alignment with some of them. My team is here, it's only five people, and we need to analyze the Kadifa, so it's one by one. If you have any suggestion, because they have their own regulatory um, trust among them, and maybe they have another, uh, some, some procedure, so you could give us the hint. They do not publish, but they are open to make available to the agency in case it is needed. Okay, excellent. So I think I will need it. I will need your your help with this. Yeah, okay. You can count on us. So you can talk to the associations. We are interested in that. So we have a a, a big passive in the reliance. We'll accelerate the analysis. We, uh, we can approve and rec recognize, but there are three items, so it would be become much more uh, quick. All right, thank you. The, so the best practice, m best manufacturing practice, um, well, the norm is, talks, uh, is about the obvious. You have to fulfill the, the manufacturing uh, norms if CADIF is issued, it can be suspended or cancelled if it is, it is understood that the process is not according to the good practices or a serious um, health um, non-compliance. So CADIF has this device. In the RDC 753, we have the registration of medica uh, medication norm. We need a technical responsible, the technical person in charge, attesting that Kadifa is following the um, following the 
RDC considering the new uh, regulatory framework. The medication norm that can be DTF, DIFA, it asks for DIFA and CADIFA, so we, we are going to follow up this BPF. But we don't need the CBPF to do the follow up. We can either not issue or suspend the CADIFA. But it is mandatory for the registration of medication. And the RDC 73 have the same um, recommendations. Now, the question. When the manufacturer of the intermediary does not make, does not uh, manufacture the final IFA, how can you proceed? Do we accept the certification with the fulfillment of uh, CBPF, the good manufacturing practices? It is just file the absence of the good, ma good manufacturing practice uh, certificate for for each place of the, the material of the end, I mean, the starting and intermediate uh, material, this absence is justifiable. So for this one, uh, the starting material is not necessary, but for the intermediary, we have we already have a decision on that. And there is the guidance of what is presented as uh, intermediate, intermediary uh, manufacturer. You can present declarations in following the terms that we have at Kadifa it is available to be inspected. So we suggest the use of them as a model. Also, you can present a certificate of the local authority. So just send the annexes uh, informing you fulfill all the demands or a copy of the report, the concluding, concluding report of the inspection issued by the sanitary authority of the country acknowledged by Anvisa. So it is a suggestion that it is interesting for us to see in the case of intermediary manufacturer. With the the purpose of not, in the case that they do not issue the CBPF. So we need to make sure they are fulfilled, they are compliant with all the norms, all the, the procedure. Criteria of CBPF or best practice, manufacturing practice, for the manufacturer, for the intermedi inter intermediary fabric, uh, manufacturer of API, it can be done. The request of CBPF can be done, but in the register checklist, it's not demanded this request. So we'd like to understand what are the uh, requirements and criteria to follow to request or not the CBPF of an intermediary manufacturer to uh, prevent jeopardizing the publication. Yes, we want to consolidate the cases for this. We haven't done it yet. I'll try to bring some examples to you. Places of manufacturing that carry out only the physical phases that do not have the phases of chemical synthesis, the CB, uh, CBPF and DIFA for the places that have the previous, uh, the previous phases. That's all I can say for now. We can see, we can check it. We need to check it case by case. We, for the for the manufacturing in the in the local in the location of the intermediate intermediary, we are avoiding that. We're just getting the more most critical cases in which it is obvious to have the. Uh, good, good manufacturing practice certificate. Concerning the census uh, route of API, uh, an ingredient coming from the chemical industry that still has to go through chemical uh, stage, uh, steps and also to be commercialized as a um, API that is that goes through a simplified transformation. Considering some demands uh, received, we would like to uh, confirm the understanding of the agency on the fulfillment of uh, GMP, good manufacturing practice, and thinking of also the 
the intermediate intermediary manufacturer of the synthesis. Yeah, we have some more detail here. We understand that for the first case, it is not needed. And for the second one, it is needed. In the first case, the intermediary is, com is coming from another market, per se. It's from the chemical industry. And this one, in the second case, the intermediary is also an API manufacturer. So I wouldn't say it is mandatory, but we would normally um, request it. And Kadifa will reach this person uh, eventually. So it's important to have it, to have the um, GMPC. As it is in the R RDC uh, 47, 497 to 2021, the registration holder can use the GMPC. Can another company use the same GMPC? Yeah, I answered yes. All right, Hannah sent this question to me and I said, I said yes to him, but I didn't see it was a renewal he can use it so it is only up to that part so it's a different uh, people requesting so you need to you cannot have a, re a request for renewal from another company yes um this is his fault because it, he didn't he didn't send that that question appropriately i'm just kidding but it can be done if the certificate is valid if the first re requesting uh, entity doesn't know for sure they need to ha to have a new request a new request yes i forgot to write n no here the answer is no it's probably it will not indicate new inspection it, it's going to be a document analysis so you can request everything that can facilitate the analysis People, this is Michelle. She's the coordinator of Going If I Forgot to introduce her to you. I think you all know her, right? Marina, intermediate uh, intermediary manufacturer, um, GMPC. Considering the analysis uh, below, uh, it's a company of the same economic group with a different uh, place. Again, the answer is no, uh, in fact, not yes. The question is about requesting the same GMPC for uh, the same economic group and the same place of manufacturing. So the, the GMPC will be connected to the place of manufacturing. Only because of this, the answer is no. It will require a new analysis, and there will be a risk analysis. In this case, we may require inspection or not. In this case, we need to evaluate. Doesn't mean that the second one will have an on-site inspection. You can just do the risk analysis. Yeah, maybe. We're working in possible changes in our procedure to encompass, increasingly encompass certification uh, in these cases. But if it's a new place with a new registration, you need to have another request, a new request. Interpreting service apologizes the person is not using the microphone. It is the same manufacturing place, but the buildings are different. In that case, you could include the API. The yes was only for this. So it was it's yes, no, and no. Okay. Yes, that's right. If it's the same manufacturing place and only the, the building is different, it is considered to be the same. So the answer is yes. However, there it's 
it's done case by case. Sometimes we get an analysis, and with the uh, requesting uh, manufacturer, we separate this registration. There are situations in a visa with different uh, registrations, with different address, but uh, they have different buildings. But as a general rule, yes. So you are uh, decoupling the, the registration like a like a, as if you were doing a surgery. But I think you understood the rationale, right? The possibility of Cadiv and GMPC. As it is provided for for the different cases without Kadifa, when there is a change in the specification of method of, of API, should we only follow the, uh, the requirements of the framework two of the R RDC 73? We have a specification of API, a specification of the holder of DIFA. If, for DIFA and Kadifa, it you follow the change. <laughs> Kind of follow for differ without Kadif in the cases of pharmacopeia, it is used the previous specification. What would be the the framework to be followed? It is the same answer, but we are not aligned. I would say. Kimad considers the authorization and Koifa considers the DIFA. Oh, okay. In that case, protocol. The change of DIFA without CADIFA. 1B, 1A, and the medication holder changing. It is the same, okay? I'm André from Maché. Uh, still about the specification of the norm has a limitation, but do you have any idea of when you review to improve the point? The important point, in my opinion, is the 4.2 of the specification. The 4.3 indicates the uh, pharmacology uh, specification. If there's an update of test, that would be a change of tests and import material to improve this specific point. We want to do this alignment of understanding. It's a different point involving specification. So it is in the radar. If you ask us to move faster, we will do it, but it is in our schedule. There are some changes to be done. I will present it in the in, during the challenges. If we do not generate demand, many things will be ahead of us. For DIFAs or CADIFAs, there's a topic code. 1171 change minor change by exclusion by changes that are minor by exclusion for defas or donker defas there's no specific topic code in this case how would the what petition would you do for the registration of the medication so 73 already talks about this and the item four defa changes that are not foreseen in the annex two this should be done considering only the conditions of the bcd and e changes so you need to have a change by exclusion you need to look at the conditions of each topic and see if your change uh could be put there oh defa without a codifa it says 
It's minor without exclusion. How should I do a 73? I go and change B. Does that fulfill that? C. Does it fulfill that? No. Then I go to D. No. Then I go to E. You you see which one you protocol, which one that you fulfill the conditions. You can't. Don't need to go to three five nine. Sorry, we wanted to hear your voice, but let's do it for another question. There are cases, uh, we already did this. Yeah, we already talked about this. Because up here, my reading is uh, compromised. In the case of that one's already, uh, I don't already talked about a lot of these. What about this one? This is from Pat. If you need a Pat for a 1L change, well, according to 73, you can read Marine, I'm sorry. According to 73 and change one, connection of Kadifa is an immediate implementation requires an individual protocol. Considering the requirement that we need to send to a visa after the post registry and has the objective of evaluating changes and clearing up the need for a pad in case of the regulation for Kadifa in case there are no changes between the condition that is registered in the Kadifa. No, you don't need it, right? And here I have other points. You don't need it. You don't need a pad for 1L change. There was no change for your approval condition. You're just uh, adding the Kadifa to your process now. Is it about this? Okay. There's a question. I just want to take advantage of that. There are certain changes that are also administrative, especially when we have a change of DFA without CADIFA, and then we need to do protocol through 73, and 73 requires a PAT. And when we go to PAT, then we wouldn't have any changes that would demand for, uh, actually filling out the PAT. Do I need to send, or can I justify it? It is acceptable that you justify it. You have the Article 3 and 73 that you can justify pretty much anything. But this is a very generic question, so I can't really tell you exactly. Oh, this or that situation, you might need it or not. This is something that the company will... Usually you don't need it. Even the question is in 73, you have various changes that we already say that you don't need it. Uh, yeah, exactly. This is a very clear case where you're not going to have any real changes. If you're the DEFA holder, it's the same. So then you won't have a change. But then you can justify it. Yeah, depending on that. Okay. Look, this is a Kadifa event. It's not a patent event. I'm just going to add to my question. Because in PAT, we have information from the medication, the technical uh, documentation of the medication, just like we we're talking about the specification conditions of, like I mentioned, when we have a specification change just in the API, we're going to change in uh, changes one, and that wouldn't actually change anything in, uh, as far as the medication. So we would just do a change in annex one item one 73 but is the manufacturer of the medication changing no not necessarily oh in that case that's just a one and i'm not talking about the specification of the medication the manufacturer of the medication no just the specification of the api by the uh, manufacturer of the medication no by the defa holder because if this goes into the specification of the medication uh, then we go into annex two or another annexes of 73 of the api as well by if it's done by the manufacturer of the medication then i would go through item two and by the other ones in 73. And then that would require uh, filling out the patch, but not in changes in item one, which are exclusively about the APIs. It might be that item one also require PAT. It will depend on the situation. It's because in thesis, I wouldn't have any changes in my medication, just in my API. Okay, then let's go back. I don't know if this is very clear. The manufacturer of the API is going to be doing the type 1 change. 
the manufacturer of the medication is going to be doing a change in their API. They're going to be doing the control. There's a type 2 change. Well, in this case, if we're doing a change of DFO with Alco DFO, I the uh, the manufacturer of the medication and requisition might change this through the the uh, manufacturer of the API, but that also has specific Pat also has specifications of the API in general discussions. So I can't just tell you that it cha all changes in type one will not involve a Pat. Okay, I can't give you that general answer. In that case, that type one L change. That yes, but it will depend on the case. All right, thank you. Question, Marina? Anvisa suggests that a company from the same economic group that is hosted in Brazil be responsible for the distribution of CADIFA and a representation between both companies, the international group and those that are hosted in Brazil. No, you don't need them. Many manufacturers report that they have a difficulty in seeing their mailbox in the system, seeing that they don't have the customer verifying them frequency. Is there a possibility for the system to send an email automatically when there is a demand in the in the mailbox? No. I would want that, but it's, that's not under my domain. Is there a forecast of building a database with APIs and manufacturers that have Kadifas approved? Yes, we do want to publish that. We know that DQM has them, so something sort of in the same uh, mold, but we need to discuss this anyway. It's a very complicated theme. What has been the, what is the timeline considered for the consideration of analysis for the um, API manufacturers? Before they had said that it was five uh, work days, but we've been seeing that that has not been fulfilled. Yes, we're trying to do that, but at some moments the system is, uh, is off the air, someone is in vacations. It's not an activity that COIFA should have, but we're we're doing this with as much zeal as possible and trying to keep our timelines. And I'd like to congratulate the people who work in that area. And in the future, we should have an evolution of the system so that we can avoid that registration. I think that we'll have a meeting next week and it might be that we improve this scenario. The creation of DHN for the manufacture of API is currently created by email without creating any tracking number, protocol number, process number. Is there the possibility of creating some sort of tracking number so that the manufacturing company of the medication can see what's going on in Visa and can help in any uh, added demands as done by the agency for the API manufacturer since it's a new procedure. The API manufacturers have been reporting many doubts. Of course, we're going to try and but no, but the answer is we're going to try and do an evolution of the system soon. We're working with that goal in mind. It's not an activity that I wanted to have at COIFA, but we're not going to invest a lot in the system for that. We're going to wait for Invisa to do this, allow the international companies are able to access and, and do the registration. That's the perspective I have to present here today. So that's it. Thank you very much. What's our time like? If you want to stay, you can stay. We have a final presentation. It's about the challenges that we have ahead of us. So we can, if you can change the presentation now so that we can win some time. Congratulations, Marina, for the collaboration. You already talked about the challenges throughout the day. This is just to consolidate this a little more. This is using Kadifa in another Kadifa request. Someone had asked about this in the morning. So this is a flow that we want to when your intermediary is an IFA and has Kadifa, they're going to their intermediary did by another API, they will get another Kadifa, but you don't need to submit all the intermediary. Of course, we're going to be inspired by the AQM uh, flow that already exists, but we're going to adapt it to our own needs. So maybe we'll have a change in the 359 or an IM to uh, encompass this. So we have this nice little slide. And let's say you have. I uh, API C through intermediaries A and B, but then you also through 
API C, you produce API uh, D. And then API for API D and D for C, then the API can become an intermediary. And this is sort of what happens for a few molecules. Lorantidine, and then the manufacturers can use lorantidine and then uh, another acid. We have scenarios like this for some molecules. So i just like to remember that the starting material is the same for everyone. That doesn't mean that I start from this and that is my starting material. No, it's an intermediary for this one. The starting material A, starting material B, and then API B, C. Why do we have this more established? Well, we want the holder of this DIFA to do, do the notification of the process of the Kadifa to indicate this Kadifa as a part of the analysis of this other Kadifa if we didn't emit the Kadifa for uh, DIFA C since we have an API that has a DIFA and a Kadifa, then this is going to be a part of the analysis. They say that this Kadifa should already have been issued. We're not working with this scenario because we're beginning and we have very few Kadifas, so we're going to analyze both of them together. So we're going to ask for a similar uh, registration than what we asked. So the holder of, of API D or DIFA D has to present a letter from DIFA C authorizing DIFA C as a part of the analysis of, of DIFA D. This is the text from, uh, from RDC 73, but it's very bad, right? but it's what I'm using. When there's a restriction of confidentiality between the holders of DIFA D and C, then the DIFA D needs a declaration that using the open part of DIFA C, and we're going to the holder of DIFA D has to say DIFA C is my intermediary or my starting material because it'll guide the documentation that they will present and that we will evaluate. So when your API, the previous API that is an intermediary, then we want this to go into 32S1 manufacturers. You need to have the address of all the previous manufacturers together with the synthesis routes in the, of the intermediaries in section 322. And then when it's a starting material, then we have 32SS, which is starting materials. You can have the official name and the address of the manufacturers of the starting materials. If they're intermediary, they're in 2.2 or 2.1. And if they're start, uh, starting materials, they're in the 3.2 in Kadifa. When it's an intermediary, this location will be in Kadifa because it is a intermediary manufactured. But if it's a starting material, then it's not a Kadifa because we don't have starting materials in Kadifas. It's a little weird, but that's what we're working with. That's a challenge. Mention what I said, the uh, starting material is this one. Do not uh, mix that when it's an intermediary. So let's define the starting material according to the guidelines. This change that I just mentioned is something that's on the radar to promote this change that has these pharmacopical uh, op operations. We are still, we are going to work with a change by uh, annual notification. It's a question about that. So we have the intention to do these changes regarding uh, the ones that are related to the pharmacopical um, changes. The change of method because of the update is recommended by the uh, 359. We have a problem with the, the DIFA that's not updated. So we have a scenario that I brought here, the assets by year from the submission year. So we have one from, we have some from 2020 that's not updated. The first bar is 50, so we maybe have 20 here from 2022, got over 100. 
in the current year 250 so as at some moment we are going to need to work with deadline because the documentation is not updated and it's not good to analyze so I fight for my technicians here in orange the one that I distributed to the responsible area we got some things from 2021 that's still in the line and here the waiting for analysis same way just to show that we have old processes on our line the change of model let's erase the place of manufacturing so now it's the owner of the diff we have two differs three different can have ten places but that's the mindset that we want to work on new model we talked about that we're um, going to try to explain we have the manufacturing of the difa inca difa the owner of the registration and things that happened in between you have the physical stage are we going to Kadifa or the registration of the medicine it depends on the who's the responsible for that it's not from Kadifa it's outsourced by the owner of the Kadifa It's a hard uh, subject to explain. I'm sorry, I can't hear because it's not on the mic. And that involves uh, incipients. We sometimes we have a mix of incipients. And then uh, the discussion is about who is the responsible for that. And we have uh, internal uh, the decision three and here, uh, then we can identify what's the ratio that we use that i'm promising so many things now this change of model so here i have a historic graphic blue the api's registration uh, the ones that were called 11 302 and now kajifa this is a challenge the change of model 2023 we conclude the analysis on the three models Besides, we have the, the same required, we have different flows, so it's a challenge to dance with the song. Another one, communication through systems. You need to go on the mailbox. We need to highlight that with your suppliers. Sometimes they take two months to read the documents, so please help me that they read the documents because I don't want to send emails and I don't have time to do that and this lack of communication is a challenge so we ask for collaboration we are in direct contact we take the material that we make and uh, follow it assist and migration and all the Kadifa inspection is in, are on the system. So we need to review all the Kadifa handbook to have the internal and external alliance, relicense, WJO. We are learning 750. It's like a pilot, pilot. it's a temporary norm. It's something that we talk remember uh, the subject about start point start material uh, my answer was let's see when this cap was analyzed uh, cap is not a bad material but it had a we can't have a big registration which is recent so that's not have prejudice with the old cap and implementation of the cycle of life of the Kajifa. We know that's coming. Every time that we approve more Kajifa, we are talking about changes. We know register and post register, and we have a lot of things. So we got this expectation to uh, have more 
I will have more work on me. And the uh, interesting manifestation, we don't have perspective to, to analyze. Thank you to you all for your presence, collaboration, questions. I'd like to thank Duke Melly, Queens, the directory, all the COIFA team, the trainees, and all of you. It's an internal joke. All of you, because you send your question, I hope that uh, it was fruitful. It's an effort for us to make uh, this kind of event. We uh, want to make that uh, each. So I'm going to open uh, and call Ronaldo to close. Thank you very much. Andresa, can you close? So that's it. Thank you very much. I hope that you enjoy. And let's keep going. Koifa, we build together with you. Thank you.